without spending much time, uh, welcome everybody uh, to the third uh, theme one workshop of, on uh, roughly September. Uh, so we I think we have a, a terrific program today. Uh, uh, we also had uh, a, a, a lot of uh, great submissions, so it's, it's good news, meaning that we have a lot of interest. It's bad news for our conscious because we have to make hard choices and uh, and that's uh, of, of making trade off and, and so on and so forth. The conference has a lot of uh, interesting questions uh, with very diverse countries and, uh, and and topics. So looking forward to it. And just a quick announcement now and the end is that we should have the first in person conference coming up uh, in February for for the entire stack. So it's exciting. So, Jean, are you? Yeah, should I, should I share my slides? Yep, all, all yours. So we go for a, so it's a 30 minutes, 10 minutes of questions. Happy to take questions, uh, clarifying questions. So you very, uh, strictly clarifying question during the talk, but otherwise let's keep the discussion for the end or the chat. Sounds good. Um, hi everyone, thanks for inviting me to join this great workshop. Uh, today I'm going to talk about indirect effects of access to finance, and this is a joint work with Adam Seidel. So lack of credit is widely believed to be a major growth barrier for firms. And in recent years, there has been a surge of policy interest in improving firm financing in developing countries. As shown in this figure, you can see that many countries are providing credit programs to firms, especially to small and medium enterprises. At the same time, there's a growing number of studies trying to evaluate the impact of such programs. And most of those studies focuses on looking at direct effect, like whether borrowers' outcomes got improved after, uh, offering, after receiving um, those credits. But in industry equilibrium, credit could also have indirect effects on other actors. For example, it could affect peer firms through um, business dealing, information diffusion, and other channels. It can also affect consumers if loans helped borrow firms to improve their product quality and prices. And understanding such indirect effects could be key to measuring broader policy impacts on society. So this paper aims on estimates several types of indirect effects of offering credit to small and medium enterprises. To do this, we work with a big bank in China in which we randomized access to a new loan product for SMEs both within and across local markets in China. So in this way, we created exogenous variation not only in the firm's access to the uh, new loan product, but also in the share of its peers got treated. And we seek to answer two questions based on this design. First, what are the direct and indirect effects of improved access to finance on firm outcomes? And what are the mechanisms? And second, we combine our estimates with a model of industry equilibrium to estimate the implied wear variance. This paper built on and contributes to two main literature. First, we built on the studies studying the impact of finance. For example, the Mo McKenzie and Uju 2008 provided randomized cash grants to microenterprises to estimate the return to capital. Energy and Duflow 2014 evaluates the impact of a targeted lending program on large firms in India. And there's also a line of research evaluating the impact of microfinance. So what we add in this paper is to also estimate the indirect effect of per, uh, uh, credit programs. Second, the paper also relates to some of the recent works um, studying the industrial and uh, general equipment effects of various types of firm level intervention. And the closest re related ones are the following three papers. Uh, including Bloom, Shankman, and Verinan 2013, which studies the spillover and the business dealing effect of R&D investments in the US. Rotenberg 2017, which looks at the indirect effect of government subsidies on mid-sized firms in India. And McKenzie and Proto uh, 2021, 
uh, which estimates that both direct and indirect effects of business training programs. So our paper contributes to this literature by providing randomized evidence on credit indirect effects on SMEs and also on consumers. In addition to that, we also study the mechanisms of the effect and provide model-based welfare evaluation. So first, let me introduce our experimental design. In uh, the summer of 2013, a large bank in China introduced a new law product to SMEs uh, in Jiangxi province, located in southeastern China. The program was targeted to local clusters of, uh, of firms um, um, uh, located in like specialized local markets. So those are local markets predefined by the government where firms in the same market are uh, selling some similar uh, products. So for example, there's like furnitures market where most of the firms in the market sell furnitures. And there's also markets for building materials, clothes, shoes, et cetera. And the fact that the loan is uh, offered at the market level is the key innovation of this new program. And there are, there are several benefits of doing so. For example, in each market, there is a market office and market manager who can provide rich information about local firms to, to, the, to the bank. And this can greatly save their screening and monitoring cost. It can also save the travel cost for bank agents because by coming to one market, they can visit multiple potential clients at the same time. And because of those uh, cost reductions, the bank does not require any collateral in this new program. And they also try to standardize the loan application and make sure that they make a decision in two weeks. So those features could make the loan very attractive to potential borrowers. If a firm decided to borrow, the maximum amount of loan they can receive from this new program because 500,000 RMB, which is around 90,000 US dollars, with a monthly interest rate of about 0.7%. And the firms pay interest every month and normally pay the principal after two years. So this is a picture of one of our sample markets. And this is a market selling building materials. So we can see that in, um, in, in this market, uh, so this market is organized like, uh, like in a mall, um, but there are some other um, cases where like there's a, um, it's, the, the stores are not in, in one building, um, but like after you enter the big gate of the market, there are stores located on each side of the road. So our main intervention is to have the law officer visit trade markets monthly uh, for a year. During each visit, they would remind the borrowers about the benefits and terms of the, of the uh, new loan program and also offer to help them to fill out all the complicated um, application forms if a firm decided to borrow. So you can view this intervention as a combination of information treatment and reduction in application cost. So we have a sample of 78 local markets and our randomization is uh, uh, on both markets and firm level. So we firstly um, divide those markets into three groups. So we firstly, we have 31 pure control markets where we did not treat any firm in those markets. And then we have 10, 50 traded markets uh, where we randomly selected 50% of the firms in the market to be treated. And lastly, we have 37, 80% trading markets where 80% of firms in those markets are selected to be treated. So we measure the direct effect by, by looking at the impact of the treatment on, uh, on, on treated firms. And we measure the indirect effects by looking at the impact of share of competitors treated. So here we define competitors as firms that were located in the same market and are selling the same type of product. So one thing to note here is that even if, so for example, in a furniture market, all firms sell furniture, but not all of them are competitors to each other. It really depends on like what kind of specific products they are selling. So for example, some firms in the furniture market might be focusing on like selling bedroom furniture 
and we don't consider them as a competitor for firms that many sell like bathroom furniture. So we conducted a survey for 50% um, of firms in all markets, which gives us a total sample of around 3,100 firms. Uh, we conducted three rounds of long surveys, a baseline in summer 2013, right before the intervention, a midline in summer 2015, uh, we skipped one year in order to uh, give time for farms to borrow and grow. And lastly, an uh, end line in uh, summer 2016. So in those three rounds of surveys, we collected comprehensive data on farm and managerial characteristics, including the balance sheet information, uh, borrowing from formal and informal sources, and farm operation. And lastly, we also conducted a short follow-up survey in summer uh, 2020. And there are three components of this uh, short follow-up. So firstly, we had a market survey in which we asked for information regarding market entry and exit. And also we uh, requested for the retrospective information on firm locations back to the baseline in 2013. And we use that information to measure the geography of the spillover effect. The second component is a firm survey, which we primarily ask for retrospective information back to the year of, uh, of the end line in 2016 regarding the average prices of the firm's main product and also uh, uh, service quality, which is proxied by the average level of education of a firm's employees. And lastly, we also have um, a, a consumer survey component here in which we randomly pick one customer visiting um, the firm and ask them to fill out a customer satisfaction survey. So firstly, let's look at some summary statistics. So this table presents summary statistics on firm and managerial characteristics and the baseline. So here, each row is a regression result in which we regress variables in column one on a constant and four indicators um, indicating the four different uh, treatment arms, which includes uh, treated firms in 50% markets, untreated in 50% markets, treated in 80% markets, and untreated in 80% markets. So here, the coefficient of the constant reflects the um, uh, mean average of the variable for firms in the pure control market uh, at, the, at, the, at the baseline. And um, coefficients of those four indicators indicate the um, difference from the, um, from, the, from the pure control firms. So here we can see that our sample firms are between six and seven years old. A majority of them, like almost 70%, are retail companies with an average number of employees of about nine, uh, nine people. The average annual profits because 500,000 RMB, and this is around 90,000 US dollars, and the annual sale is uh, a little above three, uh, 3 million RMB. And regarding managerial characteristics, we see that 58% um, of the managers are male with an average age of 38. 25% of them have college level education and 15% of them have some political connections, which is defined as whether they have previous working experience in the government. And this second summer statistics table looks at data on uh, business activities. So you can see from here that in the baseline, only 25% of firms say that they have borrowed from a bank before. And a majority of those surveyed firms still say it's very difficult to get a loan from a formal bank because they normally require collateral or guarantors from the government. And among those who did receive a formal credit before, the average size of loan is around 300,000 RMB. And the average monthly interest rate is about 9%. So uh, regarding the partnership information, um, uh, on average firms have about 27 clients every day and um, they have a, a, about uh, um, six to seven uh, uh, regular suppliers. And we can see that there's no uh, significant difference uh, across those different treatment groups 
um, uh, as a baseline on all those uh, uh, characteristics. And lastly, between the baseline and um, end line, we have attrition rate of about 10.6%. And in addition to that, there's 13.4% uh, from Scott Crosta. Um, and the balance remains for the subset of firms that survived to the, the end line in 2016 and also the last follow up in 2020 survey. Okay, so firstly, let's look at the, the treatment effect on, on borrowing. So this table re reports uh, cross sectional regression where the outcome is a dummy variable if a firm have received uh, a loan from this new program by the end line. So column one suggests that treated firms are about 28 percentage points more likely to receive uh, this, this new loan. And this suggests a large treatment effect on borrowing. Column two looks at the spillover effect and shows that um, if you have more firms in the same market where this is how we define share of years, got treated, then you're also more likely to, to get a loan. And to see that in, in more detail in column three, we further divided by, by the uh, types of uh, uh, markets and firms. So here we see that uh, if you look at the coefficient of the constant, only about 3% firms in the pure control market uh, have received this new, new loan program, but all traded firms in traded markets are between 11 and 15 percentage points more likely to, uh, to get along. So this suggests uh, some spillover in borrowing and um, which can be potentially explained by the fact that all traded firms in traded markets could get the information about this opportunity um, from their traded peers. Okay, so before I show you the regression results, let's first look at um, some big picture data pattern where we plot the distribution of log sales at base, uh, baseline and end line. So this is the distribution at baseline. You can see that it's quite balanced across different treatment arms. Then three years later, we see that the blue line, which indicates the treated firms moved to the right. And this indicates a positive direct effect of borrowing. And more interestingly, the curve of the untreated in treated markets, which is the red line, moved to the left of the green line, uh, representing the, the pure control firms. So this indicates um, an, a negative indirect uh, effect on control firms in treated markets. Okay, so, so to guide our um, uh, empirical work, uh, we also developed a model and because of time constraints here, I only, per, I only present the simplest version of the model. And in the paper, we have extensions in which we consider endogenous take up and information diffusion. So the basic version is basically um, a, a mini style model with Nasty CS, in which monopolistically competitive firms are organized in local markets. Goods purchased in a market M can be aggregated to a composite QM, a good QM and the consumers have preference over differential goods in different markets. And here, HI indicates the product quality, sigma is the elasticity of substitution within market, and theta is the elasticity of substitution uh, across markets. We assume that, uh, which is consistent with our context, um, that goods are more substitutable within the across market. We further assume that firms have constant return to scale, they produce with labor and differ in productivity. Then consider a treatment which can increase the uh, quality adjusted productivity by a factor gamma, which was introduced randomly to a share of um, SM firms in a market M. Then to a first order approximation, the impact of this treatment on the revenue of a firm I can be written in the following way. So there are two components here. The first component indicates the direct effect and the intuition is that long induced improvements in firm uh, quality and productivity could enable those treated uh, firms to uh, reduce quality adjusted price, which would help attract more demand. And this is um, uh, proportional to gamma, which is the decrease in quality adjusted prices and sigma minus one, which is the elasticity of firm revenue to, uh, to price. The second term is the indirect effect and the intuition is similar in which like the more uh, the firms in a market borrow, 
the lower the market average price index is and the lower the demand for products from a, a, a firm. And it is proportional to sigma minus zeta, which is the elasticity of firm revenue to the market level price index. So this guy, our like uh, main specification as follows, in which we regress firm outcomes like profit or employment on um, uh, post multiply treatment, where post is the indicator for the midline or endline survey, treatment is an indicator for receiving a treatment, and post multiply share of competitors traded. And again, the share of competitors traded is defined as the share of firms in the same market who are selling the same type of products got traded. We also control for firm fixed defects and we cross the standard errors um, by, uh, to the market level. So here there are two coefficients of interest. The first one is beta, which represents the direct effect of the treatment, and um, delta, which represents the indirect effects of competitors' treatment. Okay, so in, the, in this first table, we report the impact on, uh, on uh, main firm outcomes. So if you look at column one first, we can see that the traded firm experienced an additional sales growth of almost 10%. However, we also see a big and negative uh, indirect effect in that if all of your competitors in the market got treated, it can induce a negative impact, which is around like 8.6% on sales. And this big negative indirect effect almost offset the positive direct effect of borrowing. And then we see a similar pattern of impacts on other um, outcomes such as profits, employment, wage. The, there's also impact on firm exiting where traded firms are less likely to exit the market, but there's no indirect effect on that. So overall, this table suggests that there's a large direct and indirect effects on uh, main firm outcomes. We then do a plausible test in which we run the same regression, but you only use the baseline data where we did not find any impact. And this, again, this uh, helps to um, validate our randomization. Next, I decompose the indirect effect to treated and uh, control firms. And here we see that while the indirect effect is negative for both treated and the control firms, but the coefficient is bigger and more significant among the control firms. However, we cannot reject uh, that the treated and control uh, indirect effects are, are the same. So basically, if we uh, include this heterogeneity, um, we see like negative indirect effects on both types of firms, but we don't have enough power to estimate all those three effects in, a, in, in the same framework. Okay, so then let's look at some, the impacts on some uh, intermediate outcomes, which might have contributed to uh, what we observed on the- uh, uh, Nine outcomes. minutes. Uh, yeah, perfect. nine minutes, okay. Um, okay, so here in column one, we look at the impact on a um, number of uh, clients, we, and we see a similar pattern of impact where treated firms attract more clients, but if more of your competitors treat it, um, uh, it is going to be a, a, a big and negative uh, impacts. So this basically suggests that the, the treatment induced reallocation of clients to treated firms. So in order to explain that, we look at the um, impact on firm quality and the uh, cost. So firstly, from columns uh, two to four, we see that traded firms are more likely to renovate their stores, they're more likely to introduce new products, and they, they have a higher quality of labor, which is proxied by the uh, average education level of the employees. At the same time, they managed to reduce their cost uh, through various um, strategies. Specifically, traded firms are more likely to switch to a new supplier. They are more likely to increase the uh, stocking period. So meaning that they are purchasing a larger amount of um, inventories, uh, but increase the frequency of, uh, reduce the frequency of purchasing. So this could potentially help them to get a better discount from the, from the supplier. And they are managed to do that because of the additional credit they're receiving from the program. They also tend to improve inventory management, meaning that those people are more likely to have a designated area for inventories. 
and they also digitalize uh, the inventory information. And the impact of the indirect effects on those variables are very small, suggesting that there could be net gains on the, on the market level. And lastly, there's no crowd out of uh, existing loans, suggesting that those firms are quite a constraint. And next, we look at the impact uh, on price and consumer uh, satisfaction. So firstly, in column one, we show that maybe because of the cost reductions that we, we see in the previous um, table, traded firms are, like mentioned, to reduce their price significantly. And there's also improved consumer experience um, in the, as reflected in the, in the consumer survey. So basically, this suggests that the, uh, uh, the main mechanism driving the main effect could be that traded firms use the law to invest, make some investments to improve the quality to price ratio, which help them to attract more uh, clients. So we can imagine that the spillover could be uh, different depending on your location in the market. So here we use the location information and divide the peer firms into uh, four types. So firstly, we differentiate between local versus non-local firms. So local firms means the five peer firms that's located the closest to a given firm. And also we classify whether a firm is a competitor or non-competitor, depending on the types of goods they're uh, selling. So this table looks at the, uh, the impact on loan take up, and we can see that while there's no diffusion effects, uh, information diffusion on traded firms because they already received information themselves, but for the control firms, they're more likely to in receive information uh, about the loan from local non-competitors and non-local uh, local non-competitors and non-local competitors. So this makes sense because if, if you have a neighbor who is not competing with you, who got the long information, maybe like through regular chatting with each other, they can just share that information. And there could be also spillover from non-local competitors who are not that directly competing with each other because firms in the same industry may have demand for a similar type of information. So like the repeated interaction motive might uh, incentivize people to share uh, information. And in light of this, we also look at the like similar drug work the spillover impact on main pharma outcomes. So columns one, two, three looks at the impact on um, main uh, pharma outcomes, where we see that there is, a, a, we still see um, a big and a positive uh, indirect effect from local non-competitors. So this could be driven by two stories. One is that um, there's information sharing from local non-competitors. So that if you, more, you have more uh, uh, neighboring non-competitors, you are more likely to borrow from the program. And the second possibility could, it, could be because of demand diffusion in that if you have a neighbor who attracted more clients to, to the area of the, of the market, those consumers are going to also shop in nearby stores which can bring um, a positive externality to, 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 to your firm. So in order to see which one is the story in columns four to six, we restrict the analysis to traded firms and pure control firms, because this would help shut down the information diffusion channel. But even with the subsample, we still see a positive spillover effect from local non-competitors. So this suggests that the demand diffusion is what is driving the, this uh, indirect effect from non-competitors. And lastly, we also look at the impact on market level outcomes in which we just aggregate all those um, variables to the market level. And the results suggest that although there's insignificant effects on market level sales and profits, but we do observe a market-wide gains in firm survival, quality, price, and uh, consumer satisfaction. So lastly, let me um, uh, quickly present the welfare evaluation results. So in order to evaluate the welfare gains, now we bring back the impact of information diffusion and we estimate an IV uh, model in which we regress from outcomes on BI, which is an indicator of borrowing, and ZI, which is a share of competitors uh, borrow. And we instrument BI and ZI by the randomized treatment and the share of competitors treated. So the IV estimation results are consistent with the reduced form. And this is the set of coefficients that we use uh, for the welfare calculation. 
So firstly, we, uh, we, we estimate the gains in consumer surplus, which is expressed as, uh, as below. And intuition is that this measures the reduction in the cost um, uh, 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 cost of saving from like uh, induced by the reduction in the quality adjusted prices. So basically, uh, the intuition is that there's reallocation where like um, uh, trading firms attracted more uh, clients and th those clients switched because uh, they value the uh, reduction in prices or improved services uh, among the traded uh, stores. So for a given sigma, we can uh, compute this uh, uh, estimates from uh, using our coefficients. And again, in producer supplies is the sum of direct and indirect impacts on profit. So let's just look at the first, first column here, which we um, estimate producer and consumer surplus, um, assuming that we treat all firms in the, in the market. So we can see that there is an insignificant impact on producer surplus, which only equals about 4% of the profit, but we see large gains in consumer surplus. So the consumer surplus is big because the direct effect of the treatment is, uh, is big, meaning that consumers do value the improved services resulting from the, from the treatment. And lastly, we also estimate the return to capital and we separately estimate the private return and the social return. So we estimate a private return of 74.2%, which is kind of in between of the current estimates by Banerjee and Duflo, which is 105%, and the more at all paper, which is 60%. The social return is different, but it's still very big. And this indicates that if we ignore um, consumer gains, this could relate to a wrong welfare conclusion of such credit programs. So to summarize in this paper, we examine the impact of improved access to finance on small and medium enterprises in China. So we firstly see that there's a big positive direct effect. The main mechanism is that traded firms managed to use a loan to lower prices and improve their product quality. At the same time, we also observe several types of indirect effects. This includes a positive information diffusion effect to similar non-rival firms, a negative business feeling from competitors, a positive price adjusted quality gains to consumers, and lastly, a positive demand externality to local non-competitors. And a model-based uh, account of direct and indirect effects on firms and consumers implies a sizable way of their gains. And again, the policy implication is that um, such indirect effects should be taken into account when measuring the overall impact of similar programs. Uh, that's all. Thanks, and I'm perfect. To uh, the thank you, Martin. Uh, let's open uh, the floor for questions. So I, I either send it to the chat or or or, or unmute yourself. And if, 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 and if there's a question, let me. I have two, two, two. I guess a probably clarifying question that you you discuss it, but I, I was not fully following it. So mm -hmm. this is the information channel uh, uh -huh. of, of both neighbors and, and maybe competitors learning about about the program, and then there's mm -hmm. the uh, I guess the, the product market competition or the business training channel. So how how you how you go through this, distinguishing both and and how is there a way to enrich the quantitative model to to have a parameter for that and be able to use the data to estimate that learning, the extent of learning? Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, uh, let's go back here. So to, uh, so here is how, how we take into account both the information diffusion and business dealing. Uh, in the reduced in the reduced form, we only consider business dealing because we assume basically assume uh, estimate an intent to treat effect, right? But here we use an IV estimation in which we estimate the impact on uh, on borrowing and the share of competitors borrow, but we instrument um, those effects using the using the randomized intervention. But will there be a bit way to do this more structurally? So you have a theory. But the theory tells you that the one goes uh, negatively through revenues. Yes. So the fact that my competitors get better, get more credit, affect me negatively. Well, that mm -hmm. that one goes positively, and 
affects mostly borrowing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we assumed a borrowing. parameter. Mm -hmm. So is, is there a way to bring that to the model and use the restrictions of the model together with the, the rich the amount of outcomes to, to tease that out in a better way? Yeah, yeah, possibly. Well, we can think about that. So we uh, we have a parameter of diffusion defined in the in the model. Sorry that I'm unable to go into the details during the short yeah. presentation. Um, and we estimated um, the parameter of diffusion. Hi, Jean. Uh, thanks for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I have a question. Like, when we think of these uh, cheap credits, there are two ways of thinking it. One is that it helps firms to um to to get rid of the financial uh constraints they they might mm -hmm. be facing otherwise but another way of view, viewing these type of subsidies is that it could be distortions which lead to misallocations for example the competitors of the firms uh will like will suffer from these type of uh, policies so Given that you observe all these uh, positive uh, uh, outcomes, does this mean that in, in an economy like China, maybe financial frictions are more uh, at the first order uh, constraints the firms face while the idiosyncratic distortions should mm -hmm. be a second order thing to consider? Well, how, how do we uh, interpret this? Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, so first, let me clarify that this is not a subsidized loan program. And the, the firm, uh, the, the bank managed to kind of um, waive the collateral requirements because of the cost reduction through the help of the like uh, information friction, uh, information provision um, and assistance from the, the market office and the manager. So this is not a subsidized program. The government is not providing any subsidy uh, to the bank and the bank um, earn profit from the from the program, but, but you're the, right the that loan, there can be. Hmm? Sorry, I remember the loan interest rate is 0.7 or something. Is that very low compared to an average market loan interest rate? Yes, it is a, a little bit lower than uh, the uh, the the average, uh, but still the bank break even uh, by, on, on that interest rate. And they're not receiving any subsidy from the from the government, and uh, um, so and also at that time, most of the loan programs uh, they're not much competitors for SME lending at that time. Where I mean now there are more competitors on that, and um, I agree that there can be a reallocation, and we did look at the uh, like whether there's any firm level characteristics that would influence the likelihood of uh, getting credit. And we see that um, the only, I think, significantly we see is that bigger firms benefited more from the from the program, but we, we did not see like um, significant impacts, for example, by uh, firm managers' political connection. So this might indicate like the like, uh, misallocation uh, might not be a, a, a big concern here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a, a hand Shang. up. Yeah. 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 Um, just a quick question. Hi, Jing. Mm -hmm. um, super interesting talk. I was really interested in the demand diffusion result that you uh -huh. showed. Um, so if I'm thinking about that right, what you're showing is that if I have a, if I'm a non-treated firm, but I'm located in a region with a lot of uh, treat a high share of treated firms that are not mm -hmm. directly competing with me, I benefit, right? And the idea is that yes. there might be increased foot traffic. Um, mm -hmm. So I wonder if kind of in the baseline, mm -hmm. you know, are we thinking about that as demand creation? So, uh -huh. you know, consumers in this region of China are spending more money that they otherwise would not have spent or, or is there some sort of reallocation going on? Are they, you know, if they go get a haircut in, in this shopping mall, would that kind of displace, you know, potentially, uh, you know, their regular patterns of getting a haircut in a different shopping mall? Mm -hmm. and, and if so, you know, kind of how, how should we think about welfare in these cases? And I guess this relates to Ying's question as well, a little bit about, about misallocation, um, you know, to the extent to which 
uh, yeah. you know, more profitable, more productive firms from other areas are being displaced. So how, how do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess the fact that we don't see significant impact on market level um, revenue and, and profit indicates that there's, I mean, this could be still driven by um, reallocation. And, um, but it's, it's the extent to which like the, like how big is the reallocation in fact could potentially also depends on the nature of the industry and the markets. So in our context, which is actually very common in developing countries, the case that is that like there's not much competition uh, across markets and the, those most of those markets serve local clients. So that could indicate like um, there could be, I mean, it's difficult for them to enlarge the consumer pool. And this could be the reason of why there's so much like business dealing effect, but impact can be different in, for example, more tradable sectors as the Rotenberg 2017 paper um, studies. Yeah. I think we, we, we have four minutes for uh, the next talk. So let's the, the, feel free to continue the, uh, the, the conversation, but let's start officially with a four minute break, break in case you, you want to, 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 to know. Sure, so should I stop sharing? Or by maybe, yes, yeah, let's so we mm -hmm. can let okay. um, Luciano. So what are the non non retail sector firms? Say it was like sixty percent retail, and then there was like a forty percent non retail. What we were we talking about? Yeah, yeah. So there are some service firms like uh -huh. restaurants. So, so there would be restaurants or coffee shops. Yeah. Okay. And they are all in this single. No, they are they are treating a bunch of of these markets or. Yeah, so yeah, in each market, there are some of those types of service shops. How, how many markets are, are, are in total? Uh, 78. 78, and each market will be, I guess, I guess uh, 3,000 divided by 78. Oh, so in each market, there's uh, about 90 firms. 90 firms. Yeah. And the closeness is within markets uh, uh, or, 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 or across market or the closeness is even within market? The five closest businesses means- Within market. Within market. Yeah, there's not much competition across markets um, because those markets <laughs> are, look, we, we have uh, like 11 different regions and those regions are not so close to each other. No, and, perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were surprised that they, if you treat all the firms, the, the answer was there's zero effect on sales. Market but level, then, yeah. But then you the, say the it's, a, it's, yeah, a high, it's a 40% return on social return on, on capital, no? Yeah, yeah. I, the magnitude can I, of the market how, how level. makes sense of the two, mm -hmm. the two results? The fact that it's 40% social return on capital and... Oh, the social return is uh, primarily driven by the gains in consumer surplus. But at the same level, if I were to give credit to all the firm in, in a market. Yeah, the private return is almost offset. They, they all, all, all goes to the consumers and so nobody gets anything. That's the idea. Yeah, yeah. And that's the two, consistent with the sigma of seven or six. Six, right, six. And, and we tried the other more conservative values and they're kind of robust. Yeah, it's more the market level. Elasticity mm -hmm. that matters for that primary sales. For that one, no. So, and I'm thinking, what well, the for the zero, what the zero sale effect is what the yeah, imagine it's Cobb Douglas across markets, and then just the, you get all the and then sales are not are zero. Sales sales would never change, but you can have a big change in in quantities. I see. That, that's a that's how we want to think about. Cool. Thank you, man. Mm -hmm. So should we get, Luciano, you wanna start, see we can start sharing and, and, and get going. So I bring two minutes on time. Okay, perfect. Thanks, thanks Bravo. Um, can you see my, my slides? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfect, okay. 
Okay, so should I start? Okay. Well, uh, well thank, thanks to organizers for, for putting my, the, uh, our paper in the, in the program. Um, this is joint work with Alvaro Matias, uh, both from a central bank, so that usually scheme applies. And in this paper, we use um, firm level data from Chile to investigate how productivity shocks faced by firms impact their decision on investment and on wealth accumulation. And we're gonna put a special attention on how financial frictions affect the relationship between productivity, investment, and wealth dynamics in the, in the data. Okay, so let me uh, give you a brief motivation. Um, well, it's well known that, that finance, among other things, financial frictions distort uh, the relationship between firm investment and, and firm productivity, as financial frictions prevent productive output firms to, to invest according to their productivity levels. So um, if the distribution of productivity and wealth are not well aligned, you know, in, the, in the sense that productive firms are not the ones that, that possess the wealth, um, financial frictions may generate an inefficient allocation of resources, and these could have important negative implications, such as low investment, low TFP, and low aggregate income. The quantitative macro literature have emphasized that, uh, that the quantitative effects of, of financial frictions on misallocation depends on this joint distribution of productivity and wealth, and how this distribution evolves over time. Okay. And for that reason, on the strength of the literature, have endogenized this joint distribution, have worked on models that endogenize that, jo that joint distribution, allowing firms productive firms to accumulate wealth. Now, the idea is that productive firms could use their, their earnings, their income, to inc increase their wealth, build collateral that allows them to overcome the financial friction in the future. This endogenous response by the firm is known as a self-financing channel and has a potential to mitigate the negative effects of financial friction. In fact, important papers uh, have shown that, at least quantitatively, that the, the self-financing is strong enough that can rapidly undo the negative effects of financial friction. Okay. In those papers, the strength of this self-financing uh, mechanism depends on the productivity process, and is reflected on how policy functions respond to, to productivity shocks. The productivity process is crucial because uh, accumulated wealth takes time. You know? So if productivity shocks are persistent and, and low volatile, uh, firms are going to accumulate wealth faster. And also, the investment and the wealth accumulation policy functions are at the center of the self-financing mechanism. You know? if, if the relationship between investment and productivity is contingent on wealth. A productive but low wealth firms should accumulate wealth earned and pay dividends every time they receive an income shock or a productivity shock. Okay, so the, the starting point of this paper is the fact that even though these objects are, are crucial to understand the, the, the effects of, of financial frictions and self-financing channel, there is little evidence using firm level data on these policy functions and especially how wealth accumulation relates to productivity. Okay, so this is, this is the starting point of this paper. Uh, also, we noticed that prevalent methods to identify uh, free rent productivity are gonna fail under financial friction. So we're gonna need to address this. Okay. So here the idea is that try to recover the distribution of productivity in the data and also the conditional distribution of wealth given productivity. And these are gonna actually allow us to evaluate the joint distribution of productivity and wealth and how this evolves over time, okay? So in this paper, we're gonna characterize and estimate the investment and the wealth accumulation policy functions and the financial frictions using firm level data. We're gonna use these policies to examine the transmission of productivity shocks to investment and to wealth accumulation and explore the self-financing channel using micro data. Okay, so basically we're gonna use a rich uh, micro uh, data on private firms in Chile, where we observe not only uh, variables related to production, but we're gonna have information also on the balance sheet. So we're gonna have information on wealth. Okay, these, these are actually, we're gonna have a panel data of real firms operating over time in the real economy. This is observational data. And with this data, we're gonna try to see how firms behave. So we're gonna do three things. First, we're gonna consistently estimate the distribution of productivity. We seek to answer how persistent and how volatile are productivity shocks. Then we're gonna document the transmission of these productivity shocks to firm decisions on investment and on wealth accumulation. And we're gonna look here for the heterogeneous effect. You know, if we, we like to see if low wealth firms and high wealth firms behave differently, or if low productive and high productive firms behave differently. And finally, with our estimated productivity and our estimated policy functions, we're going to empirically explore the strengths of the self-financing channel uh, by answering how fast 
the marginal product of capital of two firms with the same level of productivity, but they start with different levels of wealth converge. Okay, these are the three exercises in, the, in this paper. Um, to do so, we're not going to do a structural estimation of any of these structural models that have been used in the literature to study self financing. Rather, we're going to take a more non parametric approach where we're going to estimate the firm productivity from the firm level production functions. And then we're going to link productivity to investment and to wealth accumulation through the estimation of non, poly, of non linear policy rules that depend on the key state variables of these quantitative macro models. So the, the quantitative macro models that have been used to, to, in the literature to study self financing are going to motivate and guide our empirical policy rules. Okay, so th these macro models are going to be a starting point. But rather than estimate a complete model, we're going to attack directly the policy functions or, that emerge from these models. Okay. An advantage of our approach, I think, is that we're not required to specify functional forms uh, for the productivity process or for the distribution of the unobservable figure. Okay, and this is, uh, so we're gonna leave the distribution of productivity totally unrestricted and we're gonna try to learn it from, from the data. And this is gonna be important because as we're gonna show, what we show in the paper, productivity, productivity is very nonlinear. So it's a, it's a complicated object. The empirical challenge that we face is that productivity is not observable. Uh, so we're going to need to estimate it. And of course, there is a huge literature devoted to the estimation of, of productivity and production functions using firm level data, where the prevalent method is a proxy variable approach introduced by only pace and levels of pace. In the paper, we show that we need to adapt these methods uh, in order to consider financial friction. Because if we do plain vanilla only pace, uh, we're going to get a huge biases in the estimation of the firm productivity and the firm production function and their financial friction. Also, we're gonna move away from the proxy variable approach because this proxy variable is not well suited to estimate policy functions as the proxy variable do not allow for shocks in the policies, not even measurement error. And we think this is a very restricted assumption here, especially because we care about these, these policy functions. So one of the contributions of the paper is to uh, develop a methodology that combines the insights of the self-financing channel from these macro models with with uh, uh, developments in the nonlinear panel data literature to show that the empirical policy functions of the firm are identified even if they depend on this latent product. Okay, and with our uh, framework, we're gonna provide, I think, new results, both for, uh, for the production function literature that estimate productivity uh, using firm level data, but also to the macro literature by, by providing new uh, results on the empirical policy functions uh, uh, that are gonna be useful to um, to test uh, if the, if the self-financing channel is actually strong in the, in the data, okay? So of course, my, my, our paper connect to two different strands of literature. I'm gonna connect with the macro literature that study the self-financing. Here, Paco and Joe have made amazing contributions and actually their papers are the starting point for this paper. And we also gonna connect with the literature that study the testing my production functions using from level data by providing a methodology that is gonna be a robust to financial features. Okay. So the audience is going to be the following. I'm going to start by describing a very simple model of financial frictions. Uh, please keep in mind, I'm not going to estimate this model, but I'm going to use this model to motivate the ingredients of the empirical policy rules. And also going to be useful to, to give intuitions on why only page facts. Okay. Then I'm going to show my empirical framework, and then I'm going to show my results. Okay. Uh, so just to fix ideas, let me consider this model from dynamics that is very similar to a model in, in Buera, Kawaski, and Chin. This is a model uh, of heterogeneous firms that are heterogeneous and their, their level of uh, network or wealth. I'm going to use network and wealth interchangeably. And they're also heterogeneous in their level of productivity. These firms are going to maximize this content value of utilities subject to a, a standard constraint. The firm can either consume or pay dividends or invest for production in the next uh, period and can finance this either by internal fundings that came from production according to this top Douglas production function or external funding uh, issuing debt, here B denote debt. Productivity is Markovian and here the total wealth is just the total capital minus the total debt. So here wealth is the part of the balance sheet that belongs to the firm. And in this model, the financial friction is introduced as a collateral constraint uh, that limits the amount of debt in a particular year as a function of the amount of capital and productivity. This leads to a constraint in capital. So the total capital that the firm possesses to, uh, for production is going to be limited by its wealth and its productivity. Wealth here is capturing what is called in the literature collateral constraints or backward looking constraints. And productivity here is 
is capturing what, what in the literature is called forward-looking constraints as productivity determines the, the flow of future cash flows and the banks have, infor the bank have information on this and, and take uh, the productivity uh, as an important variable when issuing uh, a loan. So in this very simple model, labor is not constrained, so the labor decision is a standard. Uh, the financial friction are going to affect investment. So firms are going to equalize the growth of capital because of capital. And here there is a gap between the marginal growth of capital and the interest rate. This gap or this wage is a function of, of wealth. Um, here, this, this variable is actually the shadow value of the constraint. You can interpret this as a, as a premium that the firm has to pay depending on their, on their growth. This implies that the marginal growth of capital will not equalize across firms. This creates, it's going to create a terminating empty case, a misallocation, and it's going to lead to an investment function that depends not only on productivity, but also on wealth. Okay, so this is one of the policy functions that we would like to uncover in the data. The other important decision is the financial decision. So at the end of a period, the firm have to decide either to pay dividends or consume or increase their wealth. So here, savings are going to be a function of the return, but also are going to depend on the expected value of the constraint in the future. So under financial frictions, the firm has an extra incentive to accumulate wealth precisely to relax the friction in the future. So for a given level of wealth today, more productive firms are going to be more constrained tomorrow. And these firms are going to would like to accumulate more wealth. And these are going to create a positive relationship between productivity and wealth accumulation. This is actually a self-financing channel. So the other policy that we would like to uncover in the data. Uh, so in order to estimate these policies, we're going to need to estimate a productivity that is unobservable. Uh, so let me spend one slide telling you why only page fails if you want to estimate the production function and the productivity of this model. Okay, so let's, let's take logs to this uh, Cobb-Douglas production function. So, Typically, the econometricians have information on value added, on labor, on capital, but productivity is unobservable, and there's going to be also measurement error. The classical and dominating problem here is that you cannot do all S because productivity is potentially correlated with the input. Okay, so what the proxy variable suggests is to use an input demand decision of the firm to proxy for productivity. In the seminal paper by Oli Page, they use an investment rule. Okay, so in the absence of financial frictions and let's say adjustment cost, investment relates to productivity. So if there is no any other unobservable influencing this H function, and if, it, if this H function is a monotonic, you can express an observed productivity as a function of observed investment. Then you can plug this directly in the production function and the dominating problem is gone. Okay, because the, the, the remaining unobservable is this measurement error that is orthogonal to it. The intuition in all your pages is that Differences in investment in the data are going, to attribute, they're going to be attributed to differences in productivity. So you can use this variation in investment that you observe to control for variation in productivity. The problem with financial frictions is that, is that differences in investment in the data would not reflect only differences in productivity, but also might be driven by differences in borrowing capacity. And this is going to create biases in the estimation of all the For instance, in the simple model that I just discussed, investment not only depends on productivity, but also depends on, on wealth because wealth captures the degree of financial constraints. So in the paper, we show that for a kind of linear investment rule, if you plug this in the production function, you're going to end up in a regression like this, where I am highlighting in red the financial friction. If you do plain vanilla lipates and just control for investment, the financial friction will go to the error term and going to create an omitted variable problem. And this is going to lead to biases in the estimation, depending on the correlation of the omitted variable and the regressions. In the paper, we show that in the standard model, the covariance between capital and the financial friction is negative. The higher the financial friction, the lower the capital. And this is going to lead to underestimation of the capital elasticity. Also, uh, only picks are going to underestimate the productivity of constraint firms. Constraint firms are going to show little investment relative to the real productivity. And only picks are going to interpret this little investment as low productivity. Okay, so they're going to underestimate the productivity of constraint firms. And given that the tulip are going to underestimate the elasticity of capital and they estimate the productivity, it's going to overestimate the elasticity of labor just to compensate this in the production function. So the main message of this, of the first message of the paper, is that if you do proxy variable in a context with financial frictions, you're going to have an underestimation of the elasticity of the input that is subject to the constraint 
And you're going to overestimate the elasticity in the production function of the input that is less subject to the constraint. And you're going to always underestimate the productivity of constraint fields. Okay, so this is something that we would like to address in the in the paper. So let me show you my my empirical framework. Sorry. Yeah. So I can I just ask a quick clarifying question in this in the example you showed before. So yes. why would the investment rule be linear? That was just an example, right? No, it was because just an example. It, it was the just model an example. a model yeah. wouldn't give you a, a linear one, right? But exactly. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Okay. This is just an approximation. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So actually, in the, in the empirical model that I take to the data. Uh, investments going to be very nonlinear. I want them definitely to be very nonlinear because I would like to have different reactions of unproductive and productive firms and low uh, high water firms as well. So in my empirical uh, model, the production function is going to be similar to Lipage. I can consider more complicated production functions uh, as long as productivity is Higgs neutral. Productivity is, is going to be Markovian, but it's going to be nonlinear, and its distribution is going to be unrestricted. The main um, differences to, to the Olipec framework is, is gonna be the, are going to be the policy functions. So investment is going to be a function of not only productivity, we're going to control for capital in order to control for deterministic adjustment cost. And they're going to include also wealth as a, as a state variable in order to control for financial friction. This is going to be crucial. Of course, wealth is not a, an exogenous variable. So we're going to explicitly model its dynamics as a function of all the other state variables of the model. This is actually the self-financing channel. The other departure from early page is that we're going to include also another unobservables in the policies. Okay, within that, it's too risky for two firms with the same level of, of wealth and the same level of productivity to display different investment of several reasons. It could be measurement error, or it could be shocks to the constraint, shocks to the adjustment cost. In the case of the of the wealth function, it could be unexpected shocks to the return. So we 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 think that is important to consider also no random observables in, in these empirical policy rules, okay? So this, we are gonna depart uh, from, from the proxy variable frame. Here, my H and my G functions are gonna be uh, nonlinear because we, I would like to, to allow for rich interactions between uh, wealth and productivity. And also gonna be time specific because we, we would like to allow for IRA shocks that could change uh, 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 the relationship between investment productivity and wealth. And object of interest are gonna be derivative effects of these policies. You know, for instance, in the paper, we define this investment propensity in response to productivity shock that is just the derivative effect of the investment rule to respect with, uh, 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 with respect to productivity. Similarly, we define the wealth accumulation propensity in response to productivity shock that is just the derivative effect of the wealth accumulation a function with respect to productivity. These propensities are gonna reflect how firms behave in the data. And how, and how they react to productivity shocks. These propensities are going to be very heterogeneous because they're going to depend on the state variables. And I think we can connect these propensities to some lessons of the quantitative macro models. For instance, if this propensity, the investment propensity is increasing in wealth, this could be evidence that there are collateral constraints in the data. If the wealth accumulation propensity is positive and is decreasing in wealth, this could give us suggestive evidence that there is self-financing in the, in the Chilean data. So these are the things that we would like to, to estimate. Okay, so identification assumptions, the goal is to uh, identify the parameters of a production function, the productivity process, and the policies, given that I have data, panel data on value added, capital, labor, investment, and wealth. The productivity and the shocks are not observed, and of course, productivity is correlated uh, with observed state variables in the model. We're gonna need some stochastic assumptions that are weaker of, of the assumption uh, uh, to the assumptions made in, in, in Olipates. We're gonna need that the shocks are IID. So the only uh, persistent and observable is gonna be productivity. And they're gonna need that the production function, the investment uh, rule and the wealth accumulation rule are gonna be independent once I condition on all the state variables of the model, including an observed productivity. This means that the, the shocks that affect the policies have to be orthogonal. These are gonna give me some the description restrictions that I need for identification, okay? So given these assumptions, in the paper we show that uh, it's possible to, to identify this uh, uh, model uh, following a sequential approach. First, we identify the production function. Once we have identified the production function, we're able to identify the productivity process, and then we're gonna be able to identify uh, the policy functions. 
Ten minutes, so, Luciano. Ten minutes? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak up. Okay, so just uh, the intuition and on how we identify this in, uh, uh, using again a linear model with intuition. So let's assume that the that the conditional distribution of wealth given state variables and the conditional distribution of investment given state variables is normal. So they give me linear policies. Here, self-financing implies that this G set is a, a non-zero. And let, let's use the investment function to invert productivity. Express productivity as a function of observed investment, observed wealth, and the unobserved shop. Then we can plug this in the production function, similar to Olipex. Uh, and I'm letting invert what is an observable. Uh, in the absence of shocks, the difference with Olipex is that we are controlling for wealth. So here we are looking at two firms with the same stock of wealth and evaluating if these firms have different investment in order to, to recover variation in productivity. Now that we have a shock, because on top of that, we have a shock, we cannot do all this here because this shock is correlated by construction with investment. So what we do is like an IV strategy within the proxy variable. We're gonna use the other policy rule to construct an instrument. So we're gonna use wealth in T plus one as an instrument for, for, for investment. Okay, and this is gonna be relevant because both variables are related through productivity if there is a finance. So like the intuition here is that at least through the lens of the macro models, a conditional on state variables, more productive firm uh, should like to invest more and also would like to accumulate more wealth in order to, to finance future investment. So it's this correlation between investment and wealth accumulation that reveals variation in productivity and isolate this variation from other shocks. And we're gonna use this to identify the, the production function. Once we have identified that, oh, sorry, we extend this for nonlinear uh, 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 policies, but I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time. So when I, I identify the, the production function parameters, I can define this net income process, just subtracting the, uh, 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 from the income, uh, the inputs, and this is gonna be a function of the, the, the unobservables. So here now the, the challenge is how to separate what is persistent productivity from measurement error. Okay, so we are gonna use the fact that this is a hidden Markov uh, model that implies that if we have three observation of, of the, this net income process, these three observations, are independent if I condition on productivity in t, in t minus one. It's gonna allow me to construct moment restrictions to identify the distribution of the shocks. And when I have identified the distribution of the shocks, given that I have the distribution of the net income process, which is observable, by the convolution, we can identify the distribution of productivity. Let me show you how this works in a very simple example. Let's consider again, a linear model for productivity. If I plug the net income process in this model, I'm gonna end up in a relation like this. And all less between y hat and y hat t minus one will not work because y hat t minus one is correlated with epsilon in t minus one. But I can use y hat t minus two as an instrument for y hat t minus one to recover this raw set that is a persistent of productivity. We have three observations from y hat, y hat t minus two, y hat t minus one, and y hat t, I can recover the persistent. And then I can construct other moment conditions to identify the other parameters, that is the variance of a measurement error and the variance of productivity. In this linear model, I am able to recover everything. In a non-parametric model, we can do this in a more uh, 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 using the same instance. Um, now, once I recover the, the productivity, let me show you how to recover the policy. Again, in a linear specification, just with intuition. This G set is actually the parameter that I care. This is the, the self-financing that relates productivity to wealth accumulation. I can plug Y hat again here. And all this will not work because Y hat is gonna be correlated with epsilon. Epsilon is a measurement error of y hat. But then I can use either lags of y hat or future values of y hat to do again an instrument regression. So I'm gonna explore exploring the time series correlation uh, in the net income process to identify first the productivity process and then the effect of productivity on the policies. Okay. Again, in the paper, we extend all these insights for non-parametric identification uh, uh, when the policies are non-linear. So let me show you quickly my results. Uh, as I said, I have panel data, I have more than 10 years uh, for firms where we have information on value added, physical capital, wealth, investment, and also a, a labor. Okay. So let me show you my first result that is related to estimation of, of the production function. Here I am displaying in the first column, paint vanilla only paint. This is just controlling for investment. 
And in the second column, I am showing my, my approach where I control for, for financial frictions. As I said, all UPEX are going to underestimate the elasticity of capital according to the, to the macro model, and are going to overestimate hugely the elasticity of labor. Actually, this 0 0.46 is more in line to the labor share in Chile. Okay. And also, UPEX are going to underestimate the persistence of productivity and are going to underestimate the volatility of productivity. Okay. Olipex are going, as I said, underestimate the productivity of very productive firms that are constrained. So, and also are going to kind of overestimate the productivity of low productive firms, but with a lot of wealth. So Olipex are going to free distribution of activity, and this is going to lead to underestimation of the dispersion of productivity. All of these parameters play a crucial role in the quantitative macro literature. So either if, even if you don't want to, to estimate empirical policy rules, and, but you want to inform your quantitative macro models uh, uh, with micro data, especially the production function parameters and the productivity process, you need to consider financial frictions when you estimate these objects from frame level data. Okay, so this is the first method. And also the return to scale, no? You know, yeah. And also return to scale, totally. Mm -hmm. actually, actually, in Olipec, this is also one. Here is, 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 is lower than one. Yeah. And this is going to be influence the, the profits of that the firm can, can actually use to self finance. Right. Now let me show you the results on the on the policies. Uh, this is the investment policy rule. Here I am displaying the the propensity of investment, uh, uh, how investment change with the productivity shock. As I said, the propensity is very nonlinear. So I'm displaying here the propensity for different level of different levels of wealth and different levels of productivity. And the main message here is that yeah, there is a lot of heterogeneity in the propensity. It goes from 0 0.1 to 0 0.6. Okay, the propensity is at its lowest for firms with low wealth and low productivity. According to the macro model, these firms could not rely on wealth; they are collateral constraint, but also cannot rely on earnings because they, they are very unproductive. And for that reason, I think that these firms cannot adjust their investment when they receive a, a positive productivity shock. For these firms that they actually the, this propensity is 0 0.1, it's too low. Um, however, this, this propensity increase as we move along the wealth distribution or if we move along the productivity distribution. For instance, for, for, for two firms with the same level of wealth, low wealth, the firm that is more productive are gonna have a much higher propensity. The propensity goes to 0 0.2, almost double. This means that these firms, even is, if even uh, if the firm is, let's say, collateral constraint, the fact that it's productive uh, um, gives you the possibility to invest, maybe because it can rely, rely on earnings. So I think this suggests so yes, that earning based constraints are playing a role here. And also, for any value of productivity, the propensities are increasing in wealth. Okay? So, so it seems that, that collateral constraint plays a role here in the, in, in, in the Chilean. Okay? Let me show you now the other policy that is the wealth accumulation policy rule, uh, wealth accumulation re uh, response to productivity. Again, I am displaying this propensity uh, for different values of wealth and different values of productivity. This propensity is also very heterogeneous, goes from 0 0.2 to almost one. Here, the, hi the higher propensity is for the firm that is collateral constraint, but is very productive because these are, according to the, to the macro model, these are the firms that benefit the most for an increase in, 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 in for increasing their wealth. Okay. So for these firms, the propensity is almost one. This means that they are like a, a, translating all the new income shock in savings. Okay? You can interpret in this model a productivity shock as an income shock, so an unexpected income shock. So these firms are almost saving all the new income shock. Then the propensity a, a decreases as we move uh, as we move along the wealth distribution because uh, as the firm get more, more wealth. Going to be less constraints of the, the free to, to accumulate more. Okay, this is my, one, my last slide. So, finally, let me show you a quantitative exercise. Here I take uh, my, my estimate, my uh, productivity, and also my policy rules to evaluate the convergence of, of the MPKs of two firms with the same level of productivity, but that they start with, that, that they start with different levels of wealth. So, here the, the red line is a firm, a poor firm that is located at the 10 percentile of the wealth distribution. And the uh, green line uh, is a rich firm that started at a 90% percentile of the wealth distribution. Here we can see that 
there is a, a huge uh, gap in, in MPKs at the beginning. So the, the, the MPK, MPK of the pool frame is three times the MPK of the rich frame. And then we can see that these MPKs converge. So there is kind of self-financing. However, the convergence takes time. It, it takes almost 50 years to see convergence in, the, in, the, in, in MPKs. And this is for the high productive firm. Okay, for the low productive firm, they're gonna take like more than 100 years. Okay, so here the graphs show that there is self-financing. However, self-financing is not that strong in the sense that it takes several decades to see convergence. However, half of the gap have been eliminated uh, uh, after the first 10 years. So still there are also financing here. Okay, so let me, let me conclude. Here I, I discuss a, a flexible nonlinear framework to jointly model and estimate uh, the wealth accumulation dynamics and the unobserved productivity process under financial friction. Okay. I show that our framework could reduce potential biases in the estimation of productivity and production functions when there are financial frictions. And also we show new results on the empirical policy function. And I, and I wanna highlight this. I think this is the first paper that go directly to the policy functions that emerge from these quantitative macro models and attack the policy functions without approximations. And actually consider productivity rather than approximation or a proxy for productivity. Uh, and then we show empirically uh, uh, how firms behave and, and how these policy functions looks like in that. In that. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, it's going to be super interesting. Um, let, let me start with question. I have uh, Julieta raise her hand first, and then uh, in Jonas might still have a question. Maybe it's a question from before. So let, let's start from there. And the rest feel free to uh, to jump in or raise raise the hand. Hey. So uh, very nice, very nice paper, Luciano. I, so I have a kind of a comment on 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 the way the, the results are presented and a few questions about the implementation. So um, one is, you know, I, I wasn't clear whether, you know, you keep comparing these to Olipex, but this seems to me much closer to Ackerberg Caves and Fraser when they use their non-parametric approach than to Olipex. And that kind of confused me because for a while I was like, okay, do you need some invertibility assumption, which is the, the typical thing that you need when you do Olipics. And I think you're getting rid of all that by going non-parametric, but I think it would be useful to kind of frame it against ACV and uh, ACF instead of uh, Olipics. Um, that's just a presentation, but kind of more substantially. So first of all, I think you don't need the invertibility assumption, but just if you can clarify that. The second thing is one problem when you try to estimate these, these functions in, you know, I did this at some point is that you get a lot of zeros in those investment in the investment series. So is this a constraint for you too or not? And can you get around it? And the other thing uh, the, that's just on implementation and the other thing that would be useful also, I, I would have like a kind of um, uh, some discussion of an old paper by Hoppenheim and Rogerson that tried to estimate productivity in a model where there is labor um, frictions, labor market frictions. And they make a very similar point. It's like, you know, once you have labor market frictions, you cannot just go and estimate a productivity uh, uh, series the same way that you would do it uh, if you're just doing pro uh, production function estimation. So I think some of those ideas might be helpful for, for this paper. So, you know, a couple of comments on presentation and just a few questions on implementation. Great, great. I, I like you to write this point. Yeah. I just compared to Olipage because it's the, let's say, the, the seminal paper, but in the paper we discussed that all our uh, comments apply to either Olipage, Levinson Petrin, or, or Akelberg uh, as well. The point with, of Akelberg is that um, you don't have actually real variation to identify a production function because uh, typically uh, there is nothing that creates variation between capital, labor, and productivity. Okay? It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a typical problem of identification. That, um, here, actually, in the context of financial frictions, uh, the financial friction creates this variation. So in in, in, in Akilber, the thing is he said, OK. You need to assume it. Here, you have it. Or it's assuming e the friction. E e exactly. If you have a financial friction, there's going to be differences in your input that are not attributed to differences in productivity. Uh, Actually, the point of factor that the nice point of factor is that even if you observe productivity, 
you cannot run your, your, your reaction function regression because productivity is collinear perfectly with capital and labor. No? Here, the, the, the friction is creating this uh, heterogeneity or this difference reaction in capital that is not related to productivity. So actually, the, the, the financial friction gives you uh, some variability for identification. Um, and how do you get around the zeros in investment? Uh, that's a, that's a good, a good point. Uh, let, let me answer you this in two, uh, I have two types of answers. First, uh, empirically, at least in the, given that this is a paper that is much more, let's say, flexible than OLIPEX because we are also allowing for shocks. Uh, um, so we don't have this monotonicity assumption that is required to, to do the inversion. If you have shocks, you cannot invert productivity as a function of the, the, of the input because there are shocks that actually create this, if you want, non-monotonicity. Um, so we're gonna need at least a panel of three, three years. So we, are, we require, let's say, more from the, from the, from the, span, from the, from the data. So when we condition on firms that have at least three waves of data, uh, we, just 2% of our, um, our sample have zeros in investment. At this point, we're eliminating these, uh, uh, these zeros because we're not taking this into account. Um, of course, it could be, it could create some, select, some, some selection. But that would be part of the identification, right? So that, that is what is nice is that zeros in investment when you have all that heterogeneity will give you identification. But I, I you know, I want Jonas to-, but to also I, Are you question. aggregating the data or just using three these these join years? No, no, we, we just, no, we, we need, um, yes, we need that at least a firm appears three times, three years consecutively. But, 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 but it will be, an, will, will there be any still an issue that you have for two years as zeros in terms of interpreting the data? It's not that you are aggregating those three years. And so yeah, when so you aggregate over three years, there's less zero because they have. Yeah, no, no, that, yes, no. So far what we're doing exactly is uh, we have our complete that, uh, database and then we are keeping just a firm that at least appear three times uh, consecutively. If the firm um, disappear and, and then enters again, um, we are gonna consider this as, as an another firm. So we are not restricted to have the same productivity than before. Um, this is the way we are handled the, the data so far. And another way to handle this is to say, okay, this is the same firm and maybe have three years of data, then disappears and then appears again. And this is actually the same firm and we, and, and we need to, to address that this, this firm have, let's say, the same productivity process. This is something that we are not doing, uh, right, doing right now. We can handle this because one different to OLIPEX, given that we don't, we don't need to invert the, the investment function is that we can handle zeros as well. The problem with zeros in, in OLIPEX is that uh, if, there are, if there are zeros in investment, different, these firms can have different productivity, but given that they display uh, zeros, they cannot use investment to recover productivity. Given that we are not inverting the investment function, we don't need this monotonicity if you want, we can allow for zeros in the data as well. So let me, uh, before we run out, is there a question, another question? Uh, no. Yeah, I still have Jonas, my question. Yeah. Go, go for it. Yeah, okay, so I, I also had some questions on the production function estimation, but in the interest of time, maybe uh, I focus more on the conceptual one. So, so one thing I'm interested in is, so you, you say that you observe assets, but so what you take in, on the balance sheet is, is reported net worth, right? And so yes. it's not obvious to me that this maps 100% to models of uh, entrepreneurs with, with assets, because so what you, what you report on the balance sheet is, is kind of any assets that are part of the business, right? Business assets. So, so there are some incentives why you might actually separate accounts, right? You, why, why you want, not want to have private assets as part of your business account, right? So for, first, uh, kind of that's the first conceptual question of like whether we actually measure, measure assets. So, and then kind of the second one is kind of related to the, the results you find. So here 
you find kind of much slower convergence. And so I'm wondering whether you can kind of disentangle this a bit more of seeing why. So, so what, for example, what I would be interested in is whether you see slower convergence for older entrepreneurs. Like, I guess the self-financing channel, this, the, that should be, the, the incentive should maybe be stronger for young entrepreneurs than for older entrepreneurs. I, that, I mean, that's just uh, to, to kind of get at the behavioral mechanism that's driving this, right? Right, so I take your point and then, the, yeah, let, let me start with the second point. I think we can do this. This is, this is a nice suggestion because we have the, the age of the firm. So we can actually condition on, on age and, and try to see how convergence looks like depending on that. That's, that's, that's nice, I wanna, wanna try this. In terms of the, of the of network, yes, what we are, we are using now is just, yeah, wealth is network for us. It's total capital minus total debt. So we can, we can actually uh, go and be more, we can, Kind of split this net worth in, in different things. We, we, we know what are, like, let's say, a, a fixed assets. We know what is a, a retaining earnings. And we also have what is financial assets. So we can actually play with this and try with different measures of, 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 of wealth, if you want, in the, in the empirical application. All right. So let, let, me, let me officially finish the, this, uh, this session. There will be 10, nine minutes of break, but let's, let's keep on discussing. I have a couple of questions, so we'll stay, stay talking through the next nine minutes. But everybody should be free to, to disengage at will. You want to finish the, do you finish the answer or no? Yeah. So I guess I have two, two, two comments, a question related to, to, to this. So one, so I guess one was about the, 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 the network data. I guess potentially the, the worry would be that there's a broader balance sheet of these, uh, of these entrepreneurs, because maybe this is one of the many investments that these individuals could have. And I would worry how, I was curious how, how to incorporate that in the estimation of how to think about that. And the other one was more also for, is sort of for, following up on, on Jonas. So the, how, is in this interpret the, the results on the on the um, the policy function estimate. I guess what, one, two simple ways to try to think of, interpret them would be to say, well, let me just force a CRA and just back up the best possible a, a, a IES that match the data. A more interesting one would be given the nonlinearity is, is to say, well, maybe maybe a model with a, and you given your work, you cannot be sympathetic to that to that work. Would be to say, well, maybe maybe it's a, there are no interest in homotopicities at play. So why would be the most? And now I can I can instead of fitting a CRS or yeah, or back up in a CRS parameter uh, specification is uh, well, I can back up, take your favorite uh, non-homothetic no, no uh, version and, and, and do, what do we learn about that? And what do we learn about uh, is the, 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 I guess the IES would be barring with potentially with wealth and, and what is the, what, what is the underlying IES or the, the, the profile of IES that, that come up with from these estimates. So that, that would be uh, pretty cool. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. We are trying to move in, the, in that direction. Um, now that we have these, let's say, these, these, these empirical policies that maybe are not necessarily in line to what have been found in the quantitative literature, trying to use the empirical function to, to maybe discipline and also disentangle different types of models. It, it could be models that have different preferences, as you said. Also, could be models try to, to, to see if models with different ways of incorporating the financial friction. Also, uh, for instance, in this, this model of financial friction is introduced as a, as a quantitative friction. Uh, but also, if you, if you introduce uh, the, the, the financial friction as a, as a friction in the price, in the interest rate that depends on wealth and productivity, also, conversion is going to take. More time that in the quantity that, that in the quanti, uh, quant, uh, in the friction with quantities, because you have to pay a high interest rate, and, and, and this is gonna prevents you to actually save and accumulate faster. So I think we can also use our empirical rules to 
uh, uh, to try to see which of these models are, are more in line with the data. Changing the, the, the preferences is, is, is uh, one direction, as you said. The other could be changing the, the way the financial friction is introduced in the, in the, in the, in the quantitative model as well. But yeah, we are, we are, trying, to, we are now trying to do that. Um, yeah. I want to come back to, to, to the, the first question by Julieta because I, I, don't, I think I didn't emphasize this. Uh, 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 well, um, in the paper, we compare our results to Ackelberg as well, to Ackelberg, to Levinson Petrin, um, because all of these approaches are going to fail if there are financial frictions. The, the, the Ackelberg approach just adds to, to, to Olipex the fact that they can. They control for labor in the in the let's say in the investment equation. Yeah, you know, Paul, what they, I think he's just right. saying, look, there is an omitted, mm -hmm. an obvious omitted variable problem. I think that mm -hmm. we all understand and it, and it's good. And I think going non-parametric is the way to do it. I, I didn't take it, I didn't say that way. I was just surprised about comparing these two Olipex, but it was more presentation than okay, uh, right. anything okay, of nice. substance. There is you're just basically saying there is an omitted variable. We need to take this seriously. And, yes, exactly, exactly. And perhaps and, with, you know, kind of adding to Paco, I actually didn't take this as preferences, but more thinking about the technology. So you could expect that there might be capital deepening happening. So something that could be going on is that there is capital deepening at the same time they have productivity improvements. So having those, those so something that the non-parametric approach will allow you to do is that those elasticities are not kind of... You, now you don't have a structure on that. We typically put a structure on that to run the regression. You saw that in your linear examples. You don't need that. So I think it's just kind of describing what type of technologies could be consistent with exactly. what you find in the data would be really useful. Even, you know, kind of on the margin of what is happening with the financial friction, just the structure of what type of technologies you should be thinking about. I think that would be really nice. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. So one more question, maybe, maybe along similar lines, is um, uh, as a, I, I really like the idea of exploring this, um, how the assets uh, affect the, these policy functions and especially the application. Um, so again, there's a question about the implementation. So uh, we have all these different uh, theories of what might make large firms more capital intensive than small firms. One of them is financial frictions. Uh, another one is that for TV shocks are non non neutral. Uh, another one is something about the non rivalry of capital, um, like uh, is several different ways of, of doing it. And it's it's uh, all, all the, the the ways I, I've known to approach that don't use this extra information about assets. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that you kind of have this information. I was just wondering how how, how you've been uh, think think through how those different theories might interact with what you're what you're doing mm. uh, at least for, for the the question of, of non-neutral technology yeah. uh, i think we cannot do at least with the, the material we have now we can we can say nothing about it uh, actually one of the the um the assumptions that we need to let's say non-parametrically be able to identify the productivity process from the net income process is that productivity have to be fixed neutral um, for, for more complicated technologies where, where productivity is, is no neutral, and maybe let's say we have a CES with no neutral technologies and things like that. Um, I think we, we're, not, we're gonna need to, 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 to put more structure. Um, well, the, because, well, yeah, the, I mean, there's something about the, the I mean, the, the, the amount of capital you use co-varies with the amount of sales you use, and that, that tells you something uh, uh, in in the standard production function, it tells something about the non neutrality of, of productivity. But you have the the extra information that the your assets might play a role on top of that, right? So like the a firm with with more assets might have a different covariance of capital and sales than a firm with less less assets. So there's there's mm. something about the you have you have this extra information that can sort of be used to 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 tease that apart somehow. Um, I see. I see. I see. And yeah. potentially having you, you have a structure from from preference that will put restrictions yeah. to that, and you have mm. if it, if great information, my regions of the great information and interest rate may may give you information on the constraint. Yeah. 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 Y
I think we're going to be getting by uh, to going to, uh, uh, to the uh, third talk. Uh, Julieta, you be free to to uh, to share. And and actually get, get going. Now you can hear me okay? Perfect. All right, awesome. So uh, thanks so much for putting the paper in the program. Um, this is joint work with Namrata and Hester Zhang that is, uh, was a student at Cornell and now is at DSA. So in this project, we wanna talk about uh, rental markets for equipment. Okay, uh, if this allows, if the slides allows me to move there. So uh, why do we wanna talk about rental markets? Well. Rental markets have been exploding in the developing world, in part aided by uh, technology, the kind of the boom in information technology. In particular, rental platform, platforms for agricultural equipment are growing, and sometimes those those platforms are aided by the government. But uh, we don't have a very clear understanding of what the distributional and efficiency effects of those interventions are. And this is what what the paper is trying. Trying to, trying to understand. Uh, kind of a, a concern about policy uh, around policymakers is that the subsidies to equipment tend to be regressive. And why do they think they're regressive? Well, because if you go and kind of look at data on prices for those that we have available, you will see that there are longer, lower rental rates for large holder farmers. So it's a it's a big constraint that you know yes we want people we want farmers to mechanize. We want to subsidize it, but if these subsidies are regressive, maybe this is not going to be great. Uh, so governments have been intervening in these markets to actively benefit smallholder farmers. So what we want to do here is we want to uh, step back a little and we want to wonder whether there is actually an efficiency equity trade-off in these equipment rental markets. Is that do I really need to intervene in these markets? Are these farmers uh, actively being uh, priced out of the market or not. So how are we going to do that? Well, the way we're going to do that is given that, uh, you know, I'm describing this differential pricing for large and small farmers, we immediately need to be thinking about frictional, a frictional model, a frictional model of rental markets for equipments in space. Why space? Because equipment needs to travel to be able to generate the service. And then we're gonna uh, consider two empirically relevant service, service dispatchers. We're gonna have a first come first serve dispatcher, which is gonna be the typical way in which these governments try to tilt the, alloc tilt the allocations towards small farmers. Um, and then we're gonna have profit maximizers and the profit maximizers are gonna like to uh, serve larger plots. Why? Because if you need to move equipment in space, you're better off getting, you know, once you get there, serving a larger plot of land than serving a smaller plot of land, given that you have moved the equipment there already. And then what we're going to do is we're going to build a model, we're going to pair the model with a new transaction level data set of equipment and rental markets. Um, and then we're going to combine that with the census of the farmer population to have measures of productivity, for example. And then we're going to run a quantitative evalu evaluation. So this is very much a quantitative evalu evaluation of, of these markets. For whatever reason, I cannot move my slides. There. OK, so what do we find? Um, so we find that market providers prioritize large scale farmers, which I think um, um, you could um, advance already. But small scale farmers actually help optimize capacity utilization. So a provider doesn't like to have a machine idle for a long time. So these small scale farmers happen to be useful because they optimize capacity. They, they allow them to optimize capacity utilization. And then the sorting, the endogenous sorting in the model is gonna be such that small scale farmers are gonna serve if they are located in dense areas, okay? And then what I think is interesting from this exercise is that we're gonna have nonlinear effects of rising equipment uh, supply. So the serving findings rates for small scale farmers, which is kind of a measure of their access to these uh, services, can rise above large scale farmers if the increase in supply is large enough. And kind of uh, the implication of that is that 
kind of going back to the question, is there really an efficiency equity trade-off in equipment rental markets? We're going to argue that there is not, not there, not really, not for the levels of the subsidies that we have been seeing in the intervention that we're going to be assessing. Okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to first build a model, then tell you how the rental market looks like in agricultural equipment in our application, and then I'm going to run a quantitative assessment of the market. So this is a model. Um, the model, just the bare bones of it, is going to be a directed search model. So you can already um, advance from here that all the allocations that I'm going to be discussing are going to be efficient. OK, so that's what the directed search model is going to buy me. And then what we're going to do is we're going to extend SHIS framework uh, to allow for providers that are going to have multiple services or vacancies during each period. So instead of saying a standard directed search model where a firm posts a vacancy, here a, ser a service provider is going to post multiple vacancies within a period. Um, there are going to be service capacity constraints. So basically, a machine can only be run for a given amount of hours. You cannot just um, you know, run this forever within the day. And that's going to uh, put an interesting trade-off into this problem that hasn't been really studied. Um, and then we're going to have these different dispatching technologies that I was describing before. That's on the provider side. On the farm side, on the demand side of the market, I'm going to have uh, heterogeneous farmers. Some are going to be large, some are, some are going to be small. And they're going to demand equipment hours that are going to be proportional to, to the size of the plot. OK? Um, and then they're going to have different productivity. They're going to have some expected productivity. And some of the productivity is going to be affected by the fact that sometimes they face delays. I'm not going to have time to talk about in detail about what these costs are in the data. But in the paper, we document that there are substantial costs from having your equipment late in terms of your productivity, your yield, or your uh, um, um, your revenue per acre down the road. And then we're going to have that these farmers are located in space. So the travel, the, the providers are going to have to reach these locations, and they're going to face the travel time B. So what's going to be the game? The game is going to be is going to be such that the providers post these rental prices are. If you have the ability to select who you're going to serve first in a, in a queue, you, you may have that technology. Some will have it, some not. And you're going to post those prices with commitment. Then the farmers are going to see these prices, and they're going to decide where to go to look for these um, uh, services. And that's going to use a probability, kind of a, uh, you, you need to think of this as a mixed strategy. So these farmers are reaching these different uh, providers with some probability P, and that's going to induce queue length. So you're literally going to have a provider with a queue of farmers at their door. Why is this nice? Because our data is going to allow us to see those queues directly. So we're going to be able to discipline them. Um, and then once you see that, then the providers are going to choose who to serve if they have that ability. And uh, that's going to induce a service probability delta. OK? Um, I is going to be index the type of farm, and J is going to index the type of provider. Then the farmers are going to produce, and they're going to have an ex post productivity cost if they happen to have the machine coming up late. And we're going to focus on a symmetric mixed strategy, Cleaver. Just so you get an idea of what the payoff looks like, uh, I'm not, again, I don't have time to go into the details that those are all discussed in the paper. But let's think about what the market providers are doing here. You need to think of uh, somebody that holds a machine, a machine owner, and now they face some queue, a queue, okay, of farmers of different types. They could be small, they could be large, okay? And if they serve, each of these farmers of type I, they're going to receive a revenue, which is going to be their rental rate, which they're going to be choosing, uh, times the amount of hours service. Okay, that's going to be the revenue. And then the cost of serving these guys is whatever salary they need to pay to the driver that is driving the machine. And 
whatever opportunity cost of time for the driver of traveling to a given location. This is gonna be the distance that they have to travel to reach that particular form, okay? And that's gonna be subject to a time constraint or a capacity constraint. So the machine can be only run for say 10 hours in a day. And you're gonna have to distribute those 10 hours of a machine between kind of actual service time and travel time to different locations. Okay, and as in a directed search model, what these providers are going to do is they're going to take the farmer strategies or the queues as given. So they know that when they change prices, if you lower the price, there are going to be more people showing up at your door. If you increase the price, there are going to be less people showing up at your door. Now, for the market providers, the market the market providers are gonna have the ability to select orders. That's gonna be this guy here. That is guys basically saying, look, I see a queue of say 10 orders. The first three guys that show up at my door are small orders that happen to be far away from me. I don't like to serve those. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pump to the top of the line, the large guys that are more profitable for me to serve. That ability is gonna be the ability of a market provider. The first come for serve providers, which happen to be the, the ones that are subsidized by the government are not gonna have that ability. So if the small unprofitable order shows up first in line, you're gonna to have to serve them, okay? Because that's what the government is trying to do. It's trying to give some advantage to those guys. So what are the farmers gonna do? Well, the farmers are gonna choose who they are gonna queue with to which provider they're gonna go. And the way they're gonna do that is they're gonna minimize the cost of service, okay? Subject to whatever the expected uh, uh, profits from being serviced are. Here I'm killing all the labor allocations. So literally you need to think of, you know, I demand some machine hours, then I'm gonna have some productivity. The cost of those machine hours is gonna be R times K and uh, the probability of being served is Delta. And that has to be larger than or equal than your value of margin uh, market participation, which is kind of the standard in the in these directed search models. Okay, this problem is going to induce some queuing behavior. Okay, which is what we're going to take to the data. Now, what is happening with productivity? So, farm productivity is going to have an ex ante component, component and an ex post component. The ex ante component is going to be some z bar that is gonna give, be given to you at the beginning of the period before you enter the season, you can think of this as the ability of the farmer. And it's gonna have some distribution with mean mu and variation and standard deviation sigma. And then there is gonna be an ex post productivity, which is gonna be a function of how late do you get this equipment to you, okay? Now, this function is gonna be asymmetric. Why? Because empirically, that's what we see, okay? What we see is that if the equipment shows up, say, a day late, so theta here is the realized service date, which is going to come from some distribution, right? That is going to depend on who you are queuing with and what's the probability of service there. If the equipment shows up a day late after some optimal service date, say the optimal time for planting your plot, then you're going to face a cost per extra day uh, of delay of eta. And we're gonna have high frequency data to estimate what this eta looks like, okay? If the equipment shows up a, little, a bit earlier, we don't see uh, much of a cost in the data. So that's why we're gonna say, look, there is, no, there is no cost associated to this, okay? Okay, just so uh, we, to fix ideas, let me just put a, um, a couple of plots because I'm not really describing the full model. So the, the way to think about this problem is that you have a piece of equipment that is located somewhere in space, and then you're going to have a bunch of farmers. Those are the pieces of corn here, and the pieces of corns are going to be large farmers, okay? And then the question is, well, given your capacity, you can serve, say, two large orders. Who are you going to serve? Are you going to say the guys in the top corner or the guys in the bottom corner? Well, it depends who shows up. But in principle, because these are all in a circle, you're indifferent from doing either of those. Right. In the problem that I show you, I was doing non-separable cost. Right. In principle, you can think that uh, the problem is not 
uh, sorry, I was doing separable costs. You can think that the problem is non separable because actually the equipment needs to travel in space. So you don't want the equipment going to a plot, coming back, and then going to the next plot. You want the equipment optimizing these routes. In the paper, we discussed it at length. Today, I won't have much to say about this, but that's discussed in the paper. Now, think about what happens. So here we have large guys and small guys. My small guys here are the olive producers, OK? And what is happening is that, well, if I get a bunch of olive producers showing up at my door, and they happen to be on the route between one large plot and the second large plot, I want to serve them because they're, you know, they're relatively cheap to serve. But suppose that the, the olive producers are on the other side of the of this circle. The question is, do I want to serve them or not? More often than not, the market provider is going to ration those guys out. OK, now suppose you have the following queue. The first guy in line, so the numbers around the circle are the order in the queue. You get the first two are olive producers, and then you get the two corn producers. If you are following what the government is forcing these providers to do, you're going to say, OK, I'm going to have to do this first come first serve. I'm going to first serve the two, for, the two small guys and then serve the large one. And then at that point, I run out of hours uh, of capacity. But if you are the market provider, likely what you're going to do is you're going to serve the two most efficient ones and then leave those at the end. And now this is obviously a quantitative question is, what do you really want to do? Why? Because this is going to depend on what's the distribution in space and across size of these farmers, OK? Now, the prices that you're going to see in these markets are going to generate endogenous sorting, because now these farmers are going to have the option to either go to a market provider or to a first come first serve provider. And they're going to choose where to go. And intuitively, What's going to happen in these allocations, and we prove this in the paper, is that the small guys are going to be more likely to go to the first come first serve providers. That's the square that you see there in pink. And the market providers, the large guys, are going to be more likely to be in the market provider. But some small guys are going to go with the market provider. Why do they do that? Because they know that for the market provider, they're useful in terms of capacity utilization. So the market provider sometimes likes them. When do they like them? Where they when they happen to be around large guys. OK. So how much time do I have? 15 minutes, maybe? Uh, so let me bring. Yeah, 30 minutes. Yeah. So let me, let me bring the model to the data. So what we're going to do is we're going to use very detailed data on um, ownership and rental equipment. OK, and the productivity of these farms. We're going to have all sorts of information on farmer assets and wealth, uh, detailed input and output measures, OK, uh, which is going to allow us to have kind of a realistic assessment of, of, of the quantitative effects of, of the policy. Then we're going to have a where we are run, we run our own census of, of farming households, which is going to tell us something about ownership rates in the market, which happen to be very, very low in this environment. OK, so thinking of these providers just as their own companies makes a lot of sense. This is not just a farmer that has excess capacity and is renting it to somebody else because ownership rates are less than 4% of the population of farmers that, that we have in our sample. And then we're going to have detailed transaction data on rental services. So we're going to know how many hours um, are uh, requested from a provider, what are the prices, what's the uh, um, the size of the plot that they're serving, what's the location are, and some farmer identifiers that are going to allow us to connect that data, the transaction level data with firm productivity. Okay. And then we're going to use supplemental data from ICRISA, that is daily data, that is going to allow us to measure this cost of delays. Okay. How costly it is that the equipment is showing up to your door a day or two days after. Okay. Um, these rental service data, the transaction data, let me emphasize this because this is actually one of the, the nice features of the exercise that we run, is that that data is going to allow us to literally see who is waiting in line. So the model is going to be calibrated to those queues. We're going to be able to see who is waiting at every point in time. Okay, And this is slightly different than standard models of, for example, taxi cabs, where you typically don't see who's waiting to uh, uh, um, 
to get a provision, okay? Now, let me talk for a second about what the policy is that we are evaluating. So, uh, as I said at the beginning, this platform for equipment hiring services are growing rapidly in the developing world, and I think they're becoming very important. Um, there are, we know at least of governments in India, China, and Sub-Saharan Africa that are subsidizing these platforms pretty actively. And our analysis, yeah, 10 minutes. Our analysis is gonna focus on subsidies in the South of India, okay? And just so you know how worried these governments are about access to small farmers, this is literally in the wording of the policy. The policy was designed to establish a custom hire service center at the Hobley level with an objective to assist the small and marginal farmers to provide machineries at their doorstep. Okay? So how are we gonna solve this model? The model, this is a directed search model, so it's gonna be very stylized. So what we're gonna do is we're first, we're gonna solve the model in two steps. First, we're gonna say, let's define these catchment areas, okay, that I was describing before. And let me figure out what the equilibrium rental rates and what the equilibrium queues, what's the equilibrium sorting of farmers is um, using this kind of two by two um, heterogeneity, which is you have markets and first come first serve providers that are gonna be coexisting as in the data. And you're gonna have a small and large farmers that are in different locations. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna simulate the full heterogeneity in order size and locations that we see in the data, okay? So we're gonna simulate sample path from the joint travel time, machine hours, and productivity empirical distribution in the data. And then at that point, we're gonna quantify the expected delays, the productivity costs, and the provider profitability. For today, because I wanna focus on this efficiency equity trade-off, I'm gonna mostly be focusing on the first part of the exercise, the second part of the exercise is all discussed in the paper, okay? Let me just um, talk a little bit about what the endogenous rental rates that we generate through this process are. So what you have on the x-axis here is the rental rates of uh, the first come first serve provider relative to the market provider. And what you see, the first thing that you see is that the first come first serve provider charges lower prices than the market provider unconditionally. Why do they do that? Because the first count, the sorting is such that the first come first serve provider is going to have longer queues. Okay. And the expected waiting time, because they're less efficient at servicing, is going to be larger. How do you compensate people for queuing with you? Well, the way you do it is you lower the price. Now, this is interesting because when the policy was implemented, they already had a haircut. They forced these providers, these first come first serve providers, to have prices below market prices. And what this model is saying is, well, endogenously, that should have a rise because these guys are actually worse at service provision. Not only that, what you get is that if you look at the light blue dots here, uh, you see that the light blue dots are systematically below the dark blue ones. What does that mean? That means that the first count for SAR providers are relatively cheap for small scale providers, right? So endogenously, just as a feature of the technology, you generate that you're gonna get lower prices or, or it's gonna be cheaper for the small guys to go to the first come first serve providers. Now, what is happening in terms of access to the platform? So here, instead of characterizing queues, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be talking about service finding rates, which are defined in the bottom of this slide. The service finding rate is literally what you get in a search model as the, the, uh, the finding rate for jobs. Okay, so what is that? It's kind of the amount of people that are looking for, uh, for a job, that's the Q times the probability of success, delta, divided by the total number of people that are looking for a job in a point, uh, at the point in time, okay? Now, what do you get there? Here again, on the, y, on the Y axis, you have, sorry, the service finding rates for first come for serve providers relative to the market. What you see is that the service finding rates uh, for small guys are larger with the first come first serve provider than they are with the market provider, okay? So the sorting is doing what it's supposed to be doing. But now you, you wanna ask yourself, did the policy grant access to capital to these small farmers, which is what it was designed to do? So what you have at the top of this table are the service finding rates for small farmers and large farmers. 
with the, that are queuing with the first come first serve provider and that are queuing with the market provider. And then what you see is that the small uh, farmers have higher funding rates if they queue with the first come first serve providers, these are the government subsidized ones, than if they do it with the market providers. That's exactly what you would expect, okay? Not only that, you see that um, the small scale providers actually face higher prices because that's what the optimal allocation should do, right? These are guys that are more expensive to serve. So these worried that the fact that we see kind of low prices for large scale providers is uh, for large scale farmers is just the fact that they are exerting some sort of market power. I think this model says, no, it's not warranted. You get in a fully competitive, you know, in a competitive model where you just have a, a search friction, right? So it's not obvious that if you see smaller prices for large scales, there is some sort of market power in the background. Now, so kind of point, point number one, the policy did what it was supposed to do. But now the question is, did the policy do the best it could have done? So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna think of a market deregulation policy. So suppose I will have put all the money that the government put in subsidizing equipment supply, but I wouldn't be worried about, uh, or I wouldn't have forced service providers to behave the way they were uh, behaving, which is to have this first come first serve policy, which happens to be very wasteful in terms of resources and service time. So suppose that you leave that first come first serve dispatch constraint, and you think of two equilibrium. The first one is short run equilibrium, where you don't allow entry or exit, and then a long run equilibrium, where you're gonna allow the amount of suppliers to change so that you sustain whatever was the uh, profits uh, uh, in, the, in the baseline level, okay? Now, what happens there? So these are in the table, and in the first two columns are, I'm replicating whatever you saw in the previous slide. Look at what happened when you deregulate the market. If you deregulate the market, it turns out that the service finding rates for the small guys shoot up above the ones for the large guys. So these guys are actually served quite efficiently. Now, in the short run, what you see when you deregulate the market is that they're actually facing slightly higher prices, right, than what they were serving. Now, suppose you think about the long run, once there is entry and exit into this market, then what you see is that the service finding rates barely adjust, right? If anything, they go up even higher for the, for the small guys. But then what happens is that the price, the cost of service goes down almost to the level that you had with the, uh, with the policy, okay? So basically, what the, and, and that's why, you know, at the beginning I said, well, is there really an efficiency equity constraint where well, there seems to be none here, at least not at the level of the supply that they have generated. Now, so is this- an, Of yeah. dispatchers, no, of the suppl suppliers or of farms? What are you? What, the can you ask again? Exit of, of who? Of the farmers? The suppliers, the the, the the dispatchers. Okay. Now you can ask. Okay, is this? A, will this always happen? Okay. And here, what we do is we call. Sorry, we have an an exercise where we say, look, let's look at the supply. H, sorry, is the supply of capital or the supply of machines prior to the policy. Okay. Now, if you look at the supply of machine prior to the policy, the finding rates for small guys were relatively lower than those for large guys. They were lower unconditionally, right? But they were much lower for small guys, about the third of, of uh, two thirds of the large guy. Now, suppose you start increasing the supply of capital in this economy. What you're going to see is that the supply, as you increase the supply of capital, both these finding rates goes up. But what happens is that the, fi the finding rates for small guys start to increase and they actually increase above the levels of the, um, of the large guys, okay? So why is this important? There is actually a long discussion back in the 90s as of you know, the success or non-success of government policies that were dedicated to increase supply of capital. Some of the, uh, through, sometimes through rental markets, right? Some of them failed massively and some of them were successful. Well, one of the things that you learn from a model like this one is that, well, whether you know, you're gonna generate access for these small farmers, it's gonna depend on the detail of the economy, but at least for this calibrated economy, it's gonna be 
a non-trivial function of how much you increase the supply of capital available in the economy, okay? Only when you increase the supply of capital um, enough, you're gonna generate um, service finding rates for small guys that are above those that, uh, for, the, for the large guys, okay? Now, let me conclude with that. Um, so we know that timely access to services are important for farmers' productivity, particularly for smallholder farmers. Um, efficiency in general is gonna call for production scale and geographic density, okay? So you need that, but uh, if you have additional service capacity in the market that can benefit smallholders, even when providers prioritize large scale. Why? Because there is a, there is a channel that we typically don't, do not consider, which is this channel of service capacity utilization. And you can, you can exploit that service capacity utilization when these small farmers happen to be in dense areas, okay? And with that, I think I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll leave it and, and take questions if there are any. Uh, thanks a lot there, Julita, super interesting. Let me uh, open the floor for questions that people may have. Um, I can start, if there's not any question right away, I can start myself. So, <clears throat> so uh, a couple of questions, comment. Uh, so the, when you, you, you do the policy that you can see just taking away that, uh, that, that's, that subsidy, you know, it's the regulating. Is there a sense, well, first let's state as a question. It's not, that, it's not that the, the policy, I'm not taking away the subsidy, so I'm taking the supply, Oh, I'm thinking the, the restriction itself. on how that service should be provided. Exactly. So there is, a, is there a sense that there is an inefficiency that we want to uh, deal with? That's one, one question. And second is, I guess, I will imagine that part of what, uh, what policymakers might be con concerned with is, well, we're hoping that we uh, a movement of mechanization. That movement of me mechanization will lead to a, a concentration of production and exit to small farmers, maybe it's something that we want to have. I mean, this, this, this is an example of automation of, of some sort. Maybe that's what will happen, but maybe we want to um, smooth out that transition. And in that sense, I might be thinking of Iraha sources, paper, or inefficient automation, and, and how, you, how you can think of, about that. I guess that, that would be more of a medium term. Effect. Yeah. But so, you know, so there are, the, and the next it will be on the on the farmer's margin. Yeah. So there are two so two comments. One on the kind of what's the underlying inefficiency. We are so the way the model the the paper is written right now. It's we're kind of agnostic as we're taking the subsidy as a given. We're agnostic as of what is the underlying source that is generating an incentive for the government to intervene uh, here. What we do know, so a question that I often get is how much of this is, you know, financial friction. So people do cannot get access to capital because they don't, don't have access to financing. We actually ran a survey among these farmers. These are very small farmers. And the kind of chief constraints is that the equipment comes late. It's not that really they're not financing. And it's not even clear that at that production scale, you want these guys owning the equipment. Okay. So in principle, the fact that, so they're just too small to own their own equipment, right? Um, so having a, a rental market that operates smoothly might give access to, to these guys to, to, to equipment. And as it is written right now, we're kind of agnostic as of what that underlying inefficiency um, look like. Now, on the question of concentration versus consolidation, I think this is very much getting at that getting very much getting at that question. So there is a concern that we want these small uh, holder farmers to mechanize because that's a way to increase productivity potentially, right? But I think there is a, an obvious way to do this, which is no, just give up your land, rent your land to somebody else, concentrate, uh, you know, generate the scale and and just go for, go for, go for a scale. I think this is a very interesting question. This is saying, look, if you have enough density, you can generate a smoother transition to, to a consolidation stage, because for whatever reason, this, it might be, you know, 
constraints in the rental markets. It would be it could be preferences for the land. It could take the you know it could be that it takes a generation or two for people to sell their own uh, their own land, and that transition is very very slow. So I think it's a very interesting question, likely one that we are going to be working on coming coming forward. But uh, this is saying, look, if you for whatever reason you can consolidate. Um, having these rental markets could be a good idea. And it's not true that if you just let the market be, these small farmers are going to be rationed out. It's not that they're going to be uh, you know, kicked out from access to this technology. Because yeah, there is value. You don't have an internet in margin of farmer. That's why it understood. So you cannot, no, 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 we don't. You cannot talk about that. I mean, but no, 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 but I can talk, talk that, that's what I said. I cannot talk about consolidation versus uh, coordination. But what I do know is that if the market is the way it is right now, having these rental markets is actually allowed, uh, it's gonna allow these small farmers to get access to it. This is not asking the question, okay, are we better off just consolidating them instead of having these rental markets, which is I think where you are pushing me to go. There's a, a question um, by Jessica, go ahead. Hi, sorry, I don't want to interrupt. It sounds like it's going in an interesting direction here. Right. But okay. um, I wanted to kind of ask a little bit more about the idea of um, owners who can have the potential to rent out their excess capacity as well. And maybe yeah. you don't have anything on this because you were concentrated on that on the firm that's providing the service. But you would think that that would provide some level of competition or maybe some farmers would try both types of equipment services and maybe the equipment services from local, from other owners would get better um, as a result of having the subsidy available too. Does that, does that make sense? So we do have that, right? So in the model, you can literally access, and that was my dinky graph in there. You can access in these catchment areas, you can access a, a first come first serve provider and you can access, access what we call the market provider. Well, we are not really okay. modeling, I missed that. Yeah. but but in full, you know, in full honesty, what we're not really modeling is, you know, the, the choice of a farmer to say, look, I'm going to use this amount of hours in my own uh, farm versus I'm going to supply this amount of hours to the market. The way we're doing it right now is these are the amount of hours that a market provider, say, think of this as a French firm that is providing hours to the market. This is how much hours I have available for uh, somebody else to come and use my machine. But that margin, mm -hmm. so that margin is there. We're not thinking, we're not, we're not fully modeling this choice of a farmer to kind of use it in their own land versus renting it out. That's what we're so we won't expect to see like different rental rates between the different providers from come out of this model. I would say once you you tell me how much hours you're willing to supply to the market, you're going to be solving a similar problem to this one. Okay, that makes it sense. might be that the shadow cost of putting an hour in the market is different for different providers because their opportunity costs are different, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, that and I'm I'm styling about you know I I cannot speak to that because that's not how the model is constructed right now. And the re again, the reason empirically, the reason why we abstract from it is not because we think that you know the, every uh, setup or every environment looks like that. It just happened that in the environment that we were analyzing, uh, that wasn't a, a feature of mm -hmm. the, of the mm -hmm. problem. Yeah, we have a. I'm actually working on something in a kind of different but similar setting, so we should touch base about it. I would love to hear. That'd be great. Thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. I guess if I'm unmuted, I might um, share my screen too. Yeah. So before I guess we have a couple of minutes, unless it's another okay. question. No but go, going back to my point on consolidation, you do ob ob observe it when you take away the the, the first come first serve prices that small guys pay are going up. So that would be the, I think the margin through which uh, the, the in equilibrium there would be a, a, an incentive for for some of them to exit. Oh no no I see but the, but so if it, you it, have it's the, the policy what, what is the policy is a, is a, well I guess <clears throat> the problem the is you need to take it to be very elastic so there's no effect but at least in the short run or at least for some elasticity the supply of of, of this capital some of that will will will, will happen. 
Yes, and some of them will happen, but yeah, the problem, happen. the reason yeah. why I'm not talking about that is because that depends also on what the outside option for these guys is, right? So you could think that, yes, prices of rental goes up. What do I do? I go back to my donkey or to a labor intensive technology. So I don't necessarily consolidate, I just downgrade the technology. So there is a version of this paper, well, sure, of this paper where you're going to have... That, 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 that capital is productive and, 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 and there's automation happening and that's kind of make some guy, some farmers more efficient and, and so on and so forth. And that that could be leading to some consolidation. And it might be that the, the policy, the minor policy makers try to, to slow that, that down. Yeah, so I, mean, I, I, I agree with you to think policy. about that problem. But again, I think about the problem is slightly different than this because I think to think about the problem properly, I need to think about what the kind of what the menu of technologies that these guys have available, which I'm kind of completely silent here. I think it's a very, right. inter don't get me wrong. I actually think it's a very interesting paper to write. It just, uh, I think a lot of the, what you learn from this exercise is we need to be thinking about consolidation versus coordination and kind of what the transition dynamic across this equilibrium might be. Exactly for what you're saying, right? That there might be an optimal pace at which you want to do this, right? Let, let me pass the, the button to, uh, to Ezra. Thanks for the question. It's Jessica to start. All right, yeah, next presentation, pre presentation is Jess, Jess Rutter. Great. Um, yeah, thanks so much for uh, inviting me to present today. This, this paper um, asks whether small firms partially insure customers from price increases, and this is using evidence from retail firms in Tanzania. And so this is a, a little bit of a different setup than what we've seen earlier in the, in the conference. This is going to be a very like empirically driven paper where we're just trying to untangle some of the details of what uh, the consequences and causes of pa different pass-through rates in, in, in for food markets. So we sort of know, this group knows certainly that price variation is a feature of staple food markets in many LMICs. And I'll show you some data a little bit later that shows that this is the case in, in Tanzania as well. And so on the consumer side, this affects food access and nutritional quality of rural households because they're facing different prices throughout the year. And the, the changes and the seasonality of the prices coincides with the seasonality of people's income. So that's why there's periods of the year where rural households might have higher food insecurity than other parts of the year. So that's going on kind of in the background here on the consumer side. I'm mostly going to focus uh, purely on the firm side. So this paper is kind of asking like what happens um, as rural retailers are bringing food to their rural markets, like how are those price changes translating into the prices that consumers see? So that's like the basic question, how much of these input price shocks pass through to prices paid by rural consumers? And then in turn, we can sort of think of that as like partially affecting the overall food security of rural households due to the shifts in prices. So, so we focus on a, a year-long multi-round survey with rural and urban firms in central Tanzania. I'll show you a map in a little bit. And some of the first things that I document is the high frequency of input and output price changes. And this occurs both for rural and urban firms. So that just means, you know, in, in the firm survey, we just have self-reported measures of input input prices and output prices. And so I'm just constructing, you know, the, the, the shift based on what the firm reported. So this in this presentation, I'm going to focus just on the food staple side of things. So this is going to be rice, beans, maize grain, maize flour, and sugar. And so one thing to note right off the bat is, is we should be thinking in, in as rural households as agricultural households, but the, the products that we're focusing on are the kind of the food staples that are typically purchased in a market. So maize grain and maize flour are purchased in the market and grown locally, but rice and especially sugar, those are only available in a market, right? So people aren't tending to grow rice or sugar in this context. And so then the rest beans and maize, that's going to have some seasonality and demand as well, but we'll punt on that for now. And so the main, the main result 
is comparing urban and rural firms. And so I see that urban firms are passing through about 95% of their input price increases and 80% of their input price decreases. And so right away, we see that there's like a little bit of an asymmetry, even among urban firms, which we think of as like perhaps being like in a really competitive marketplace and having a little bit more sustained demand curve relative to rural firms, just because the population that they're serving is going to be, uh, you know, have a little bit more consistency. And the big, the big difference is that rural firms are passing through price decreases is about at about the same rate. And but they're passing through price increases uh, at 50% lower rate than urban firms. And so that's sort of the, the genesis of the, of the puzzle here is like what's going on structurally in rural markets versus urban markets that explains this huge difference in pass-through rates. And you know, importantly, especially on the increases side, why would rural firms smooth input price shocks for their customers? And so I'm gonna examine a couple of different features of raw markets to try and unpack some of these relationships. And so we're gonna look at uh, firms relationships with customers. There's some village networks and transaction costs. So these are all just gonna be captured by kind of rural features of rural communities, such as the distance that they are to the urban center and how large they are. And then we're also gonna be able to look a little bit at the competitive environment. And so, Throughout the firm, at the end of the firm survey, we have measures on how the competitive environment changed for firms. And so we can use that also to unpack like how prices shifted given entry or exit into their market. So the where, where this fits into the literature is kind of like threading a couple of different strands of literature. And, and one is related to bargaining and relation, relational contracting. So part of what I'm speculating here and arguing specifically is that, you know, rural firms and urban firms both are relying on relational contracts to sustain their business. And part of this comes through in providing input credit. So a lot of other earlier work has dealt with providing input credit, and we'll look at that here. And then there's other types, there's other ways that firms can uh, kind of build relationships with their customers. And that includes providing price discounts, or they can provide special services for their customers, such as ordering special products or, you know, just any type of, uh, any additional uh, thing that a firm can add for their customers. And so I have an, another paper, that was my job market paper from a couple of years ago that really dealt with relational contracts. And that was also in this setting. And so I'm gonna pull out some of the insights from, from that paper and uh, bring it to this new setting, which is specifically focused on prices. And so we know from uh, another paper as well that was recently came out from Hardy, KG and Song that low liquidity firms were more likely to accept lower prices in a bargaining experiment. So it shows that, the, that these small firms are sort of structurally constrained and, and part of what could be happening is that they're overextending themselves in terms of the, the, the benefits that they provide to their customers. And so this is also documented in other settings as like village networks and risk sharing. So we know risk sharing is common in rural economies. And uh, another recent paper from Kinnan et al. discusses how household shocks pass through to village firms. And so that, that makes sense. And then we're looking at the opposite direction. So how the firm shocks pass through to households. Um, and then, then lastly, this, this is also going to speak to... Um, a literature in the that has to do with competition and uh, well, I guess it more has to do with demand elasticities along a supply chain. A supply chain. So we sort of know or expect demand to be more elastic in rural areas because the aggregate demand is lower and the elasticity of demand is is higher. So it's just basically you know the idea that like the market can't bear price increases and so firms are responding to that. And so even if they would logically need to pass through more of a price increase. They, they sort of understand their demand curve and they're constrained from doing so. So this, this kind of leads us into our simple conceptual framing of how we might think about food markets in, in this setting. And so what, what, what would we expect to happen? And so just even in like a econ 101 world, under perfect competition, we expect 100% pass-through of input price shocks, and we would expect symmetric pass-through as well. 
And so then as we move away from a model of perfect competition towards imperfect competition or collusion, that's when you would see, okay, there's there's lower pass-through rates. And so on the one hand, if I'm showing you that pass-through rates are lower in rural areas, it's pretty suggestive that there's something going on with market power. And maybe it's easier for firms to collude in rural areas compared to urban areas. Although this isn't really what I see and I have some tests for it later. So um, in particular, there's a, a recent paper that came out just a couple of months ago from Banerjee et al. that showed collusive arrangements, lower competition by impeding exit in, in urban areas. And uh, this paper is kind of very much in the spirit of that because it's possible that in rural areas, like it is easier for firms to collude, but part of that collusive arrangement could be kind of things that end up benefiting consumers, including lower prices or uh, the provision of relational contracts. And so we just sort of generally know that we're also operating in a world where firms are constrained, firms aren't growing, entry and exit is high. And so that's gonna kind of color the, the background here as well. Okay, so as promised, we are in central Tanzania. And what I just wanna draw your attention to here, we're in Dodoma and Singida regions. The large blue dots here are the urban areas where we collected prices from urban firms. And then the blue dots are the rural firms. So they're sort of pocked throughout this sort of general trading area. So this down here, you notice we don't have it. This starts to become a national park. So that's why the trading area is kind of centered in the Northern part of the, of the two regions. And so just to kind of introduce these firms to you now, we have, um, sorry, I don't have, oh yeah. Okay, so here we have the sample sizes. So it's 230 rural firms and 240 urban firms. Again, these are all retail firms and these are all firms that are selling um, staples. And um, they sell non-staples too, but this particular data set is constructed using what they report for staples. Um, firm age, uh, firms, in rural areas about five years old and firms in urban areas about six years old. And one thing to note here is that something that's common uh, is that there's like seasonal entry and exit. So if you ask a firm how long they've been operating, they're gonna tell you from the first time that they started their business, but that doesn't mean that they've been operating continuously. And so I think this is still, those seem like kind of long firm tenure arrangement, but I think it's just more reflective of, of people coming in and out of the market and then they, sort of say their whole, how long they've been operating for. Um, very few have any workers in rural areas, only 15% of firms report any workers, while in urban areas, 45% uh, of firms have at least one. Um, the number of firms operating in each market in rural areas is about 24 or 25, and in urban areas, it's about 29. And so, Part of this is going to come up because I'm going to be a little bit constrained in looking at the competition in an urban area because it gets a lot more difficult to define the relevant market area for an urban firm. In some, in some places in an urban area, and maybe people can all kind of picture this, you can think of it as like the actual kind of market, the main market that people go to. But then this also includes retail firms that are just located throughout the city. So, so you can imagine it's a lot more difficult to define the catchment area, but it's pretty easy to do in the rural setting. So these are gonna be uh, communities that have, I think the minimum is like a 3,500 population. And so these are actually like not the smallest rural villages, but they kind of encompass like all of the rural villages that go up to about maybe 10,000. And so these are gonna be places where there's like a small town center. And these firms are by and large gonna come from that town center. So the way the market is constructed is just the same definition as the village. And that's just part, part of the consequence of just there's, there's concentration in, in most places. And so when we ask firms with their number of self-reported competitors, we don't see huge differences, but it is, it is different about eight in rural areas and nine in urban areas. And just overall share uh, of, of selling staple foods, 72% and 44% in each area. Um, it feels weird not to be interrupted. Do I wanna pause to uh, take any questions at this point or uh, just keep cruising, I guess, huh? Cool. Yeah, unless, there's a, uh, unless there's a clarifying question, we should uh -huh. we continue until the last 
uh, for 30 minutes. So don't, don't worry about questions. Oh, okay, 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 thanks. Um, okay, so then here are some of these price series that I that I mentioned earlier. And so what we see here is like there are some seasonal squiggles in the input and output prices of rice, beans, maize grain, sugar, and maize flour. And I think by and large, what's being captured here, and I'll get into this a little bit later too, is mostly seasonal shifts in price variation. Um, so I'll, I'll say that now and then I'll justify it a little bit later. Um, and yeah, this is, that's kind of the takeaway from here. And it's worth, it's worth looking a little bit at the um, average prices from urban and rural firms. Uh, just because it's it's useful to see that it's not necessarily the case that urban firms have drastically larger price shifts or compared to rural firms, right? So in, on both sides of the market, people are experiencing, and, and we can look at the median here, uh, about 200 to 250 shilling difference in input and output price differences. Um, even though, which we would expect prices are on average higher in rural areas than urban areas. So the median is the easiest thing to look at here because of the way the currency denominations are done. But um, so that's just something to stare at here. I can come back to this if there if this sparks any questions later on. And so as I, as I mentioned, um, input and output price changes are quite common. So again, here we're splitting rural and urban firms and this is just, constructing a graph based on how often prices decrease, how often they increase, and how often there's no change. And you can see that in both settings, the most firms don't have, or like the, the frequency of having no change is very low compared to decreases and increases in, in both markets, right? So this is just saying, you know, by and large prices are changing. They're updating pretty constantly throughout the year. Okay, so the first task that I have for myself empirically in setting up this, this kind of research design is building exogenous variation in price shocks. So the first way that I do this is just what I'm calling the firm shock. And this is just constructed at the firm time period level using their self-reported input and output price, price increases for each period. And so the big kind of like qualifier, if we're going to believe that that's exogenous, is that firms are input price takers. And so I can test this because I have a lot of information about their search process. And so I have a, a, a table in the appendix and we can look at it later if people want to, that shows that, you know, because we sort of know that firms like do have the ability to select into their input prices. And, you know, I'm talking about relational contracts. So you have good reasons to think that people would select into prices based on their relationship with their supplier. But I show in, in, this test using a search search index that for the most part, once you control for firm fixed effects, the effect of having really intense search goes away. So we can sort of think of getting to firm fixed effects as like kind of absorbing the firm's kind of un time invariant preference for their price, their kind of price regime, their input price regime. So we can think of this as kind of leaving us with some of the exogenous variation. And so the second, the second way that I construct it is using an IV strategy that uh, builds, constructs the stocks at the firm time period level after instrumenting the increases and decreases with prices from urban markets from around Tanzania. So these are other urban markets that are not in the sample. And so I just kind of grab, grab these as um, wholesale market prices from other online sources and then use an IV lasso approach to select which markets kind of fit the data the best and then use those as the shocks that will um, that will be used to construct whether or not a firm experienced a price increase or decrease. And then the third way is that I construct it as peer shocks. And so this is where I assign all market item and time periods with the dominant shock for this that period. And so this is just saying if regardless of what of whether I experienced a price increase or decrease, if the majority of firms that also sell the same item as I do experienced a, an increase, then I get assigned an increase as well, right? And so those these, these second two 
uh, types of exogenous variation, the IV and the peer shocks, are clearly meant to pick up on market movements that are happening like broadly throughout the country. And so this, the, the um, I'll show you now that these are these are relatively similar. And so to me, that suggests that there's like there's like a little bit of idiosyncratic price shocks happening here, but for the most part, it seems to be explained through just like large co movements in price price changes. So the empirical specification for looking at asymmetric pass through here are what anytime you see increase or decrease and then a label which type of shock is constructed for each one you can think of that as being a zero or one that's going to assign as either the firm either experienced an increase or a decrease in that period and then this is like fit within a first differences model where it's the first difference of the output price regressed on the first difference of the input price but split asymmetrically and so mm -hmm. we also oh, okay cool so we have also some survey around fixed effects that's going to absorb some of the large aggregate um, shocks as well. And then we'll add market and item fixed effects as well. So awesome to start moving faster. So this isn't even that interesting. This is just showing you what the symmetric pass-through rates look like. And so this is pooling urban and rural firms and just showing this is an, all a model where using the in, individual firm shocks and we see that increases pass through the elasticity is about 0.63 and goes down to about 0.61. And then on decreases, they're passing through 0.82 to 0.85. And so then when I uh, use the IV or the peer shocks, we see that these are remarkably stable. And so to me, this is what's justifying the picking up on large seasonal variation. And so where the main kind of finding from the headline of the paper comes from is, is splitting the heterogeneity by urban and rural firms. And so what we see, uh, so we see increases here, and this is basically going to be the increase of um, any of, of the average increase of, of urban firms and then rural by increases the difference, right? So here's where we see that rural firms are lowering, have lower pass-through rates than urban firms by about 33 to 42%. And on the decrease side, uh, urban firms, when they're isolated to themselves, actually have lower pass-through rates than in the pooled model. Um, so for, urban firms are passing through decreases less to a lesser extent than increases. And rural firms aren't don't have that big of a difference. So here we see there's some suggestive difference that maybe it's 10% higher. And by the time we get to firm fixed effects, it goes down pretty low, pretty close to zero. And so again, this, this is pretty well replicated using the other IV strategy. I lose um, you know, significance, but the direction and the magnitudes look pretty similar. So that's what is still giving me confidence that these are relevant instruments to compare. Okay, so let's get let's get to some of the explanations of, of rural firms pass through. So I'm gonna add these um, mechanisms. I'm gonna focus first on community mechanisms and competition mechanisms, and then I'll move to describing some of the evidence I have about like the importance of relationships with customers. So it's nothing too surprising there. So these, um, so the first, the first that I have looking at firm shocks, part of the reason that I construct the community and the competition mechanisms is I, I highlight that they're at the, the village level. So even if we're worried about a little bit of um, endogeneity in the input price search, then I'm kind of contrasting it with uh, something that is out of the firm's control in some sense. So that's, that's where to think about this. And these are all constructed as Z scores so that they're comparable. So we can compare the magnitudes across them. And so what do we, what do we think is happening? Uh, we think distance matters, right? Because we know that transaction costs get, get larger. And so we expect firms that have, that are located at a further distance, they might have different pricing strategies when they experience a shock than firms that are located closer. And with population, we think that matters because just with, you know, there's a couple of things going on with population. One, there's probably some, it captures something about aggregate demand, and it also captures something about like how likely you are to know all of your customers, because as you're getting into a smaller and smaller community, you know, you're more likely to be interacting with people that you know all of the time. 
And then the change in competitors, we do expect that once, if you have an increase in com competitors, that that's going to push you more toward a uh, having higher pass-through rates. And so um, this is like kind of a big, scary table, but it's okay. So this is just among rural firms because it it doesn't it didn't really make sense to have urban firms in this because there's no distance to market. And again, the catchment area is unclear. So there's no population sizes that are super reliable for them either. So just among rural firms, now we're looking at variation in distance population and the change in competitors. And so just off the bat, you sort of see the, again, decreases are passed through at a higher rate than increases. And then there's some differences based on different distance for increases. Uh, seen here, and so then there. How, how should I interpret? Well, I guess this is maybe I can leave it for later. But how should I interpret the the distance? Is it a is it a question of the the transportation a bigger share of the of the total cost and therefore changes in that? That's how you interpret it. Yeah, so it's going to affect. It's going to like directly affect their their transportation costs. So these are. These are situations where the firm is, for the most part, traveling to a city in order to purchase these, these inputs and then bringing them back to the rural area to resell. And so the further you are, you're just going to have higher transportation costs to get there. So the, 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 the variation in the, in the price of the, of the good is going to be a smaller fraction of the total cost. Or well, the price of the good itself is a smaller fraction yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, exactly. So it to the extent that like firms that are really, really remote have similar kind of pass through rates and they're facing similar input price changes, they're potentially just like more constrained from increasing prices, even though the, these results suggest that they're still able to somewhat because they're uh, they have to compensate for the additional transaction costs. So, so we see that on the increases, but not on the decreases side. And then on, uh, on, on population, this is constructed so that it's as the population gets smaller, we see that they're passing through, for the most part, firms are passing through less of their price increases. So this is kind of, this is consistent with both uh, a, a theory where social networks matter, and a theory where aggregate demand is 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 lower, and that there might be even more price sensitivity. So you are even more constrained from setting a, a higher a higher price because you know you have less demand, and so uh, consumers are just more price sensitive. And then we do see that the change in competitors pushes firms toward what we think of as like the competitive equilibrium. It's quite it's quite small. It's only like this is one you know one standard deviation in. Uh, increase in competitors leads to you know two percent up to three percent increase and then it attenuates as the model changes and and we see it on the on the decrease the side too so that's that's just good because we think you know that once there's entry into them that should matter to firms so it's just kind of nice to see that it does matter okay so let me quickly am i at the two minute mark yes Okay, let me quickly just tell you a little bit about how relationships with customers matter. And so here I think I'm moving away from what I showed you just a second ago, which are some of like the structural differences that are occurring at the village level. And this, these are now firms kind of selecting their type a little bit. And so the primary thing to look at here that I'll show you in a regression framework is, is whether the firm provides input credit. And so we see in, in rural areas, and now I'm splitting the rural sample between uh, large and small rural areas, about 66% of firms are selling goods on credit to their customers, while only 43% of firms in urban areas are doing it. But that's obviously non-zero, right? I think, you know, anecdotally, people often say that firms aren't providing credit. It's like bad business. It's not a good idea. But I have pretty consistent evidence in here and in other places that this like kind of credit along the supply chain is like a really key part of how networks are formed. And so then when I put this in a, a regression framework, we see that uh, depending on, so now the this is all firm level shocks, but I'm splitting the sample between really small rural, medium rural, and then urban. 
And we see that when there's a price increase, there's not big differences when there's a decrease, um, but when there's a price increase, it's pretty consistently oops, um, negative in, in all places. So this means, you know, the it's kind of difficult to interpret what a 122% increase in prices is for firms that don't provide uh, credit, but it's just kind of taking that as it is right now. Uh, so this, this still gets us pretty much closer to a kind of competitive markup, but it does show that there are these firms, even in urban areas that are selecting in to providing credit to their customers. And so it's a way for them to differentiate themselves. And so the main, that's kind of the main conclusion is that we're seeing these differences in pass-through rates and the main uh, things that explain these relationships is that it seems like the pass-through um, increases with distance, but decreases with population size. And it increases with the number of competitors, but the effect is much smaller than distance or population size. And then there's, there's different types of firms. And so we see that there's going to be variation in pass-through rates just based on whether you're a firm who tends to provide relational contracts as well. So I did it. Yeah. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jessica. We can open up for questions now. So I guess I can I can go first, I guess. Uh, so it, it's this, this asymmetry in uh, pass-through seems uh, pretty uh, puzzling in one sense in that like you, you uh, you would think if, if the differences in prices between urban and rural are kind of stationary, then you would kind of expect that the in some way the the pass through has to be symmetric in 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 some way, mm -hmm. uh, and like if the price goes down, it's got to come back up at some point. Uh, and just trying to trying to piece together what what might be going on. Like, do you do you see a differential trends in the prices uh, in rural and urban, or is it maybe something about the the lags that that uh, that that maybe price the price increases get passed through quickly, but price decreases get passed through maybe only after some time or something like that. I would have expected that too, but it actually looks like decreases are getting passed through more quickly than increases. Oh, is it, and the, so the timing does is different between the two. Uh, or? Oh, I know it's actually on the timing side. It's more just on like the the magnitude Imagine, side. Yeah. So I when I showed you the graph of what the firm kind of these this this price series looks like when i yeah. plot these are just the urban firm or sorry rural firms when i plot urban firms over this it kind of remarkably overlays it so i'm not seeing like huge differences that jump out uh between urban and rural firms here and that could just be like you know these are again self-reported and so these these firms with experience could be really good at getting the lower the lower prices and so I, I see, I think I, so are you asking because the urban firms are fundamentally the suppliers of these rural firms. So we'd expect there to be some timing lag there. Is that what you're getting at? No, just like if the price goes up, down, up, down, up, down, and you keep mm -hmm. on passing through some of the ups, but not the downs, you expect to see like a, a, a trend. Oh, that's um, a great thing to check for. Yeah, that's true, huh? But I guess I, I guess this kind of rules it out because I see that it's going up, but yeah, then down kind of on average. And you also have these the um, constant terms in these in these regressions, right? Yeah. Uh, that that would should pick up trends. Um, yeah, I haven't looked at those. So, so one thing that can reconcile it is if, if the the timing is different, so that like the 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 increases get passed on like the the next period, um, for example. So. And you know, actually, there that is kind of a feature or potentially a bug of the data collection. That so I have survey round fixed effects, and so the that's going to roughly capture like a quarter's worth of price reports. But the 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 data collection isn't simultaneous, and so that's just you know constraints of the budget and things like that. So it goes, it pretty much goes like rural urban rural urban yeah. right so there is a little bit of a timing shift and we do know that urban firms are kind of updating their stocks more frequently and, and ur rural firms do to some extent as well but um there might be some on some timing on that margin that i'm not capturing just because of the way the survey is constructed sorry can i ask something i think it's, it's related to what this uh uh, have asked um, if it's possible to include some lags in your, your regression 
So in the way to see, maybe uh, there is some convergence, maybe, um, yeah, maybe some, the, 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 the direct impact is, is uh, decreases is, is higher for rural areas, but then in time you see that maybe uh, there is some convergence in the, in the path too, and it's something that could be done. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's definitely a good direction to go in. I know I noticed in your paper, you had talked a little bit about our Ariano bond approach. I know, I, so since I have the first difference here and I don't have a super long panel, I think I would have to reconstruct it to maybe just look at price changes with lags to get at some of that, but that's that's a good suggestion. I, I was thinking that it may be useful to have a, 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 um... For some of these stories, a simple structural perspective or even back of the envelope perspective would be useful. For example, mm -hmm. with the uh, with the distant interpretation of the distant results is that principle should be symmetric for up and ups and down, but that uh, I guess the rural area have higher prices, far the higher prices because transportation cost is a is a bulk of it as a service component. And then you have this price of input change, maybe price of, I guess, of these staples changing. And uh, that will be translated, but I guess in percentage term will be translated less in areas with, I mean, in the limited area where all is cost, that we just not, people will pay almost infinite prices, but there will be no, no effect of the staple price. Um, mm -hmm. And that yeah, will give you a, a simple way to, to ch check some of these stories. And, and potentially to put more restrictions on, on how to infer the data. That's one one comment. The other comment is, would be useful to have some some benchmark. I mean, there's a huge literature in developed countries on, on price price adjustment. Um, mm -hmm. but the question is, what do we what what what, what are what, the the effects here? How they compare there? There's a literature on on the, maybe some commodities tend to be more like goods tend to be more volatile. You see some of that is something similar in related and not and um yep yeah. but i guess but julieta has a question too so, uh, yeah. yeah it's you know it I kind of adds to where paco uh, was going I, I was thinking okay ultimately why you know should we be surprised about the the differential path through and kind of why do we care about this path through i think I don't know if you can do this, but I think knowing whether you would expect that the path through is different depending on the elasticity of demand for these goods, right, in different areas, and mm -hmm. and the, there might be systematic differences in who is purchasing these things, or or the way these these things are actually packaged, which is what Paco was, was talking, right? There might be a component of services that is associated to this. So I think exploring that a little bit more, it would be useful and kind of. You know, Ultimately, why do we care about that that path through? It might be because of firm profitability. It might be because of inequality. There are many reasons why you may care about that path through, and I think I would have liked to see a bit more of of that. It would have helped me kind of put the the results in perspective. Thing something like that. Yeah, that makes sense. So. One thing I will say on the connecting it with the the kind of commodities literature, I think that makes a lot of sense. And so, where I think this paper potentially adds clarity and then potentially gets at this policy question as well is that a lot of those data are constructed using the data that are kind of readily available from so my sources from the world food program and these sort of monitoring wholesale prices and so your sort of take is given that like I think most of these models take the wholesale price in an urban area and then just just like have a model that assumes some pass-through rate to rural areas that's like purely based on transaction costs and so then this paper comes in and says like okay there's there's actually a little bit more going on there and it looks like maybe firms are are kind of not updating prices to the extent that the prior literature suggests but it's true that I haven't kind of linked that directly here and so then I, I would think that and there's probably more I can do to like clarify this and model it as well but I would think that then that um, implicates kind of the prices where that people that people pay and so I think um, connecting it to like one potential avenue to do that would be to connect it to like an average budget of a person and say okay a person in a rural area if their prices are kind of being protected by 30 percent 
uh, during the lean season, then that would mean that they're potentially spending less in their budget than, than we would have expected otherwise. Do you have quantity data? Quantity? Yeah. Not, not for uh, urban firms. Yeah. A little bit for rural firms. Yeah. It'd be nice to be able to, I mean, if you have the quantities you could get, you could estimate the elasticities directly and see if they're, if the, you get one for the down shocks, one for the up shocks, and you can see if the elasticities are different for those. Mm. Yeah, I might be able to do that on the on the rural side. All right. Well, uh, I guess it's time for our ten minute break. Um, so yeah. we'll meet, meet back at a. Uh, I guess it's seventeen oh five England time. Um, Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Everyone's welcome to stick around if they like. Thank you. Okay, I guess we should uh, get started again. Um, so our, our next presenter is uh, Xiang Ding. Okay, great. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, Francisco and Ezra for um, running this workshop and uh, accepting this paper uh, to the program. So I've learned a lot from the previous four papers. And um, uh, it, for my talk, I'm gonna actually switch gears a little bit and um, talk about large firms. Uh, whoops, can't advance my slides. Oh, here we go. Okay, so before I start, uh, typical disclaimer, this is work that uses uh, data from the US Census Bureau, so um, the usual disclaimers apply. So, um, you know, why large firms? Well, large firms are everywhere in the world. Uh, they account for the vast majority of output, and in particular, uh, most of these firms are um, enigmas. They operate multiple industry lines, like General Electric, they produce things uh, as diverse as medical scanning equipment to jet engines, um, to solar panels, wind turbines. And, and so a question that's really, uh, I think the starting point for this paper is, you know, are there complementarities or synergies uh, or if the lack thereof uh, within, uh, within such a firm? Uh, and if so, uh, can we say something about uh, which industries uh, we might expect uh, to find these sorts of uh, what I call economies of scope uh, whereby by expanding output in one industry, uh, the firm might also lower its marginal cost of production in a different industry. And I think what really excites me about this project is the fact that, you know, um, because these firms account for so much of aggregate production in not just uh, developed economies, which is the setting that I'm going to study, but also in developing countries, what can we say about kind of how industries are interlinked in the aggregate and how uh, a shock that expands kind of a nation's output in one particular industry might affect uh, its productivity and prices uh, in perhaps technologically adjacent industries. What can, how can we sort of characterize uh, that aggregate matrix of cross-price elasticities of supply? So looking on the supply side. So that's going to be kind of the, the flavor that this paper is going to take. It's going to take a micro to macro uh, approach. And uh, the starting point, um, so it's going to do this in four steps. Um, the starting point is to use data uh, from the universe of U.S. manufacturing firms uh, to do a test for joint production. So obviously, uh, kind of a benchmark multi-product firm model um, you know, that we have in mind is perhaps one where firms operate completely independent um, product lines, such that you would not expect a demand shock in one particular industry of the firm to have any effect on its marginal costs and thereby sales uh, in other industries. So we can actually go in there in the data uh, and see if this is true. Um, and uh, if it's true for all industry pairs or if there are some industry pairs uh, for which that null relationship is violated. Uh, so precisely what I'm gonna do is uh, just to preview some of the results a little bit, is I'm gonna estimate that within firm cross industry uh, elasticity of sales with respect to demand shocks. And the main finding coming out of this uh, empirical part of the paper um, is that in this reduced form, I'm going to find that cross elasticities increase uh, with the capacity for two industries to share knowledge inputs. And I'll be a little clearer on what I mean by knowledge input proximity. But for now, you think about um, uh, industries that share uh, perhaps uh, engineers, R&D, science, so similar types of uh, inputs that you buy from the professional services sectors. Whereas two industries like plastic bottles manufacturing and aviation equipment manufacturing uh, may have very, very little kind of uh, service sector inputs in common. And it turns out that that 
um, proximity with respect to knowledge inputs is what's going to drive um, empirically these spillovers. And so one way to kind of interpret uh, this uh, result in the model is, is to think about a model um, where joint production arises uh, from input sharing, that there's a set of inputs, uh, potentially all inputs, right? Um, we're going to take a very agnostic view in terms of laying out the model, but that might be a set of inputs that are shared uh, within the firm. And uh, in this model, um, we're going to have a setting where uh, the firm's marginal costs of production in any one industry might either rise or fall or stay constant with respect to output uh, in the same and as well as its other industries. So we're going to be extremely flexible uh, in terms of the theoretical setup, and we're going to allow for arbitrary economies of scale as well as scope. So both economies and diseconomies of scale and scope. Um, and the way we're going to do this is to emphasize two key properties of shared inputs that end up determining uh, whether we're in a world with economies of scale, I'm uh, sorry, economies of scope, or in a world with diseconomies of scope. And it turns out that these two dimensions uh, uh, are scalability and rivalry. So just to kind of preview a little bit what, what I mean by this. So imagine um, you have a resource like, uh, you know, management, uh, sort of CEO, which is um, a fixed input within the firm. So this input is not very scalable. If at the same time, it's also very rival. So a manager by focusing on one industry will have to devote less time on other industries. Then that's gonna be the precise instance where um, by expanding activity in one area of the firm, um, the firm will have to sacrifice its output in other uh, sectors. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, if you have an input that is at the same time very scalable and at the same time very non-rival, so think of perhaps inputs like software and R&D within the firm, then just from increasing its use of inputs uh, for producing in one sector, the firm actually ends to ends up benefiting uh, other activities of the firm end up benefiting uh, from that resource at the same time. So it's going to be this trade-off between scalability and rivalry that determine uh, whether we're in the case of cost complementarities in production. And the way, the precise way I'm going to set up the model is going to allow us to have endogenous responses within the firm on both the extensive margins, so thinking about the set of industries that it ends up uh, activating, as well as the intensive margin in response to demand shocks uh, that occur within the firm at the industry level. And so having laid out that model, the third section of the paper, which I won't have time to talk about today, is just going to uh, take the model to the data and uh, estimate uh, these key parameters with respect to uh, shared inputs, scalability and rivalry using kind of exact firm level moment conditions that leverage uh, the exogeneity of these export demand shocks uh, that I've shown you in section one. And the key result coming out of the estimation is that knowledge inputs are indeed scalable and they're partially non-rival within firms. They have, this, uh, they have these two properties and that's what generates economies of scope. And so as a sort of a, uh, you know, to conclude the paper, I'm going to quantify for you how important that this mechanism is in the aggregate. We're going to look at the quantitative implications, and uh, I'm going to do so in several steps. First, I'm going to analytically characterize what the uh, corresponding set of macro level industry linkages would look like. So I'm going to use an entire matrix that is asymmetric. Um, and so every bilateral industry pair can have a different um, uh, elasticity of prices with respect to uh, output. Right, so this is going to tell us by how much a demand shock in a sector like aviation equipment uh, might change prices, uh, total producer prices in an industry like cement production versus an industry like uh, solar panel production. And so having done that, uh, we can do a quantification. We can calibrate the remaining parameters of the model to fit US data in 2017. And uh, we're going to find that economies of scope, so precisely these off-diagonal elements of that, trans that transmission matrix, um, and so which are going to come about through economies of scope, are going to account for a quarter of what we would measure and pick up as aggregate increasing returns to scale. So just to put that a little bit in perspective, what this means is that if you hit the US economy, uh, with, let's say, a foreign demand shock that raises uh, output by 10%, then prices in the manufacturing sector, producer prices in the manufacturing sector, will fall by 0.4% more than we would have estimated because we have not taken into account uh, these cross-industry uh, transmission effects. So there's an elasticity of about negative 0.04 of prices with respect to output uh, that are coming uh, uh, precisely from these cross-industry 
um, uh, from this cross industry channel uh, due to economies of scope. And moreover, I'm going to show you that matrix result at the end. We're going to find that these cross elasticities are concentrated in knowledge intensive industries. So, aviation and equipment, medical equipment, and much less so uh, for uh, things like plastic bottles and rolled copper, for example. So, there's, you know, what excites me is, you know, really able to get our hands dirty at, you know, saying something about precisely which industries um, might we expect these forces to show up in. Um, so, just given the interest of time, um, I'm going to skip the literature and jump straight to the empirical evidence, uh, section one. So the test that I do is, is extremely uh, uh, conceptually very simple, right? So let me lay out the specification. I'll tell you what the variables are, and then I'll tell you what I'm tested for, uh, what the coefficients mean. Uh, so first of all, on the left-hand side, I'm putting uh, uh, the firm industry level uh, change in external sales uh, within the firm over a two-year period. And this is data uh, coming from the US Census and Manufacturers. Uh, and particularly coming from the product trailer files, so that even for single plant firms, uh, we're able to uh, pick up the fact that they might be a multi-industry firm to the extent that their product sets uh, fall within uh, two or more, roughly makes five-digit levels. So for me, an industry is going to be a pretty disaggregated concept. Uh, we're not going to be looking at product varieties, uh, for which you, know, you might expect things like demand complementarities or cannibalization considerations within the firm. Uh, to matter, right? This, this paper is really going to be about uh, thinking about the production or supply side uh, mechanism uh, for, for, for complementarities. Okay, so that's on the left-hand side, just sales growth. On the right-hand side, the first variable, um, uh, um, DMOG S, is going to be a firm industry level uh, demand shifter. So specific to a firm, specific to an industry. And here I'm going to leverage and sort of a, you know, the, uh, a world import demand type um, uh, instrument, uh, you know, for example, from the Hummels et al. paper, where I leverage the fact that uh, in the U.S. manufacturing data, these are exporters that are selling very detailed um, HS products to multiple destinations all over the world. And to the extent that these firms vary not only in what sets of, you know, industries they operate in, but also what markets uh, they end up exporting to, um, there's going to be variation that we can use and take to uh, construct these average um, uh, market size change uh, within the firm, right? So we're going to take uh, the five-year uh, growth in imports uh, at each destination H and product H, destination N and product H market, um, excluding imports from the United States, and we're going to interact that with the firm-specific um, export shares. And finally, scale that by a firm uh, industry-specific export intensity to construct essentially a, um, a normalized uh, measure kind of how much this market size uh, for the firm F in a given industry J might be changing uh, over a five-year period of time. Um, so to think of this as a test for non-joint production, we're gonna care about what this side cross uh, coefficient in front of this D log shop other uh, represents. And if you think about um, uh, this null hypothesis where the firm's production technology is non-joint, uh, then you would expect this coefficient to be equal to zero for any uh, specification that includes a uh, industry K demand shock on that second right-hand side term where K is not equal to J, right? Kind of like I alluded to in the beginning, if firms are truly independent industry lines and you would not expect a demand shock uh, in a different industry to affect sales in another. And, you know, under the, identify, under the ID assumption that um, the unobservables, uh, so under the rule of supply and demand shocks, uh, in industry J of the firm are uncorrelated, um, uh, conditionally uncorrelated with, um, with how we're measuring uh, these other industry demand shocks. So in principle, we have uh, a full matrix of you know, 200 by 200 industry pair elasticities to estimate, but given the sparsity uh, of kind of firm production and extensive margin in the data, uh, that matrix is gonna be, I don't have enough power to estimate that. So instead I'm gonna test two necessary conditions uh, for the null hypothesis to hold, so that a rejection of either would mean a rejection of the null. The first necessary condition um, that you can think of is, well, if the null holds, then um, um, uh, cross elasticities are at zero on average, right? So um, one way to think about this is we're just going to group all the other industry demand shocks that the firm is facing, you know, weight them by uh, the relative importance of these other industries K within the firm to construct an average. And we're going to see if this average has an impact on each industry J that has been left out of that right-hand side equation. 
controlling for, by the way, I should have mentioned, we're also controlling for industry time fixed effects that sweep away any kind of five-year differences uh, in you know, industry productivity, uh, demand, and so on that are common across all firms. So we're always comparing within an industry and we're looking at growth rates within an industry across firms that may have had been exposed to different types of other industry dimensions. Um, so that's one thing we can test, but a more nuanced thing that you would expect if there is this input sharing mechanism is that you would expect potentially heterogeneous effects. You would expect there to be, for example, a positive spillover precisely for those industries that have a lot of overlap in the types of shared inputs uh, that they use, right? So we can actually go down the list uh, we can run through the input output table. So we, we're starting with the manufacturing sector. For any pair of industries in the manufacturing sector, we can look for input overlap, right? We can look for the potential um, uh, that they might benefit uh, from the sharing of, let's say, these non-rival and scalable inputs that I alluded to. And so that second measure that I'm constructing uh, is going to be these, we're going to take these uh, industry, firm industry level uh, K demand shocks and interact it uh, with a bilateral measure of proximity. Um, that's, you know, just to kind of uh, give a bit of intuition, it's going to be the product of two shares. Um, the the right-hand side share here uh, measures the relative importance of uh, industry K as a user of input N. Um, so, for example, take the R&D example. Well, if R&D is shared between uh, K and J, you would expect J to benefit. First of all, if K is a relatively large user the shock industry K is a relatively large user of R&D, such that the firm would need to scale up its use of R&D. And it also has to be the case that industry J is a large beneficiary of R&D, input M, right? And so that beta is gonna be uh, how I measure um, both um, potential input expenditures by the firm, uh, by an industry in the firm on a given input, and also the potential for a receiving industry J to benefit from that input. So this is gonna be my measure of proximity. And we can run through this for any set of uh, potential inputs. And what I'm going to show you first is a set of results, and then I'm going to show you the heterogeneity analysis for other sets of inputs. So the main key takeaway uh, as we look at this table is that cross elasticities increase uh, with the proximity for industries to share knowledge inputs. So what do I mean by this? If we look at the first column, um, the same industry shock always increases um, uh, from, uh, from industry sales. So there's kind of a uh, this is just a nice sanity check that the demand shocks are relevant. Um, on the second column, we're going to see that other industry demand shocks, on average, um, that average term on average has no effect, right? So this could either mean that truly um, firms are running non-joint production technologies, or um, that uh, that there's sort of uh, uh, that there are some industry pairs that use shared inputs that are um, uh, that are non-rival and scalable, such that there are positive spillovers for some industry pairs, and also other industry pairs where there are, are um, uh, industry pairs uh, that use inputs that are rival and not scalable, such that then those cross elasticities are negative. And so, in fact, from columns three to five onwards, we do see evidence of such heterogeneity. Uh, we see that uh, cross elasticities increase with knowledge input proximity, and this is robust to including things like firm near fixed effects and the inclusion of very, very stringent set of firm and firm industry level controls. Um, so this is kind of a, a nice um, a robustness check and kind of a way of thinking about, okay, are there potentially other inputs in the world other than knowledge, um, whereby proximity and the use of those inputs from other categories uh, might generate heterogeneous cross elasticities. If you run through the gamut of you know, the universe of inputs from the BEA input output tables, you actually get uh, very, very different results from what I find for inputs from the knowledge sector. I'll be very clear in just a second on what I mean by the knowledge sector. So, you know, as a benchmark, for example, nice sanity check, we expect manufacturing inputs to be very specific to an industry, right? If you use a wheel uh, to make a car, you can't use the wheel to make a motorcycle. A wheel is kind of, by definition, something that's rival um, uh, within, uh, within the firm. So it doesn't really take on that property. Um, uh, that, that we have in mind that would generate these cross elasticities. And so what's kind of special about knowledge and kind of um, where am I getting um, data that allows me to measure this? Um, so uh, this is data that comes at the industry level from the BEA input output and capital flow tables. Um, and so uh, first of all, I want to just point out that expenditures on knowledge are a pretty uh, substantial share of manufacturing sector gross output. 
Uh, it constitutes 9% of those output in manufacturing. And across manufacturing industries, there's a lot of heterogeneity in what types of knowledge inputs uh, we use. So we're going to measure about 20 different, uh, roughly five to six digit level knowledge inputs. They constitute uh, sector uh, industries uh, from uh, the NAIC sectors 51, 533, 54, and 55. And these are kind of uh, headline um, uh, names uh, for the most important of these industries uh, to manufacturing. So we're thinking about things like um, at headquarter activity, which is this next 55 term, the leasing of intangibles, R&D, architectural design services, engineering, custom computer programming, et cetera. Um, so as kind of a last check before I go to the model, uh, we want to see in the data, for example, for, for you know, consistent with my mechanism, it had better be the case that firms are actually going out there in response to demand shocks and buying uh, more software, more IT. And they are perhaps doing so with a higher scalability, with a higher scale elasticity at a higher elasticity uh, than they are going out there to buy kind of normal types of inputs uh, like physical capital or uh, production line workers. And so what we can do is we can aggregate these demand shocks to the level of the firm and uh, and explore the response of various left hand side variables uh, to uh, firm level demand shock. And so in this first column, I'm going to show you that the elasticity of something we can pick up at the firm level, purchase professional services. Is, um, is high and significant uh, with respect to firm demand shocks. And for comparison, you can see what the effect is uh, uh, for firm sales and for things like capital expenditures and payroll. Um, um, so this is, um, you know, so both the magnitude and also the magnitude in comparison uh, to these other magnitudes is sort of consistent uh, with the mechanism that I've outlined. Um, so Ezra, I have 10 minutes. minutes. Great. So let me just highlight kind of the intuition for uh, what I'm doing in the model, and then I'm just going to show you um, the uh, results in sort of section four. So as I, I alluded to, the production technology is going to take um, the form of two stages. In the first stage, the firm uses a set of shared inputs. We're going to be very general. It could be anything. A, shared of share, a set of shared inputs to accumulate essentially what is intermediate output. And when I think of intermediate output as, you know, intangible capital or accumulated knowledge of the firm, right? And that's given by these bubbles in orange. And I'll tell you a little bit what, um, what makes up the value of that VAR fee uh, term. In the second stage, the second stage is extremely simple. The second stage just has firms choosing their industry-specific sets of inputs. These are like materials and production workers to generate output uh, conditional on um, accumulated levels of knowledge and profitability. So we're going to split this up in two stages, and that's really going to help with the analytical tractability of solving the model. Downstream, each firm faces CES demand in each sector. There's monopolistic competition. Firms are making decisions uh, conditional on knowing, in both stages, conditional on knowing their exogenous profitability shifters. Just to quickly preview stage two, stage two is super simple. Knowledge has already been accumulated. So both this far fee term, as well as their kind of fundamental um, um, demand and supply shifters are going to just act as a productivity term in our standard kind of production functions. And the firms are just choosing uh, the bundle of kind of uh, specific inputs uh, that they want to uh, uh, operate with, uh, subject to a you know potentially increasing or decreasing returns uh, to scale. So we're going to you know typically we're used to L raised to the power of one, but since this is a paper about economies of scale and scope, we want to be very specific about allowing uh, for sector specific, uh, industry specific. Uh, non-constant returns to scale. And given the CES formulation, we're going to be able to derive very, very clean uh, formulas uh, for um, uh, terms like the, the gross profits or the gross sales uh, of the firm and express that as kind of um, uh, functions of exogenous uh, terms uh, relative to the firm. Right? So this is BJ, which is uh, kind of a measure of uh, profitability uh, uh, common to all firms operating in an industry J. And this is precisely when we go to section four, we're going to think of uh, aggregate demand shocks in the sector as things that might hit, for example, expenditures or the level of competition in that industry J. So all the magic happens in stage one. And this is, I just want to maybe spend three minutes um, to highlight the intuition for where rivalry and scalability comes in. So um, there's a knowledge accumulation process. And this process is going to feature an extensive margin and an intensive margin. So the extensive margin is this idea um, of you know, how many ideas 
does the firm generate? Do these shared inputs generate? Right? Since we're in the world with headquarter activities R&D, we're thinking about specific tasks that are performed by highly professional workers. And so we're going to be all about that discreteness. And this discreteness is going to allow us to explain the extensive margin. For example, if there's a sector in which no ideas are adapted, uh, then the resulting knowledge or intangible capital level in that sector is zero. And in the second stage, the firm can't produce. Right? If your productivity, you're combined, given the Cobb-Douglas term, Barfi and uh, psi is zero, then, then then you're out of that sector. So it gives a very natural um, explanation for the extensive margin. So the firm essentially is choosing how many total ideas that it might expect to produce. That's the AFM term of each shared input type. And also on the intensive margin, you know, um, each idea is going to be um, uh, uh, adapted uh, in a given industry, J or K. And the firm is actually going to make that choice. The firm is going to make that choice after observing a match-specific value of that idea in a given industry. That's given by this uh, fee term uh, here. So there's kind of differences on both the number of balls and the size of the balls. And so in terms of what drives the number of balls, this is the idea of scalability, right? So if you go out there and hire more shared inputs M, so hire more engineers, hire more software uh, engineers, um, you're going to, on average, increase the, uh, the average number of uh, tasks that can be performed within the firm with an average number of innovations uh, that can arise, right? So that's, that's, and, and that's, um, th that's going to be parameterized, the elasticity of that overall number of ideas with respect to the, um, to the number of inputs of that type that you use is going to be parameterized by row, and that's going to be our measure of scalability, right? If you, if you can only have one CEO, then you can't, then that has a a uh, row value uh, like very close to one, that's something you can't necessarily use to scale up uh, the number of CEO time that you have. And so the firm, on the other hand, the firm is gonna choose uh, the industry J in which to adapt each idea. And that's gonna generate this concept of rivalry, right? Because if I want to adapt an idea in one industry, I can use it somewhere else, right? So that's gonna generate a kind of a competition uh, for resources uh, within the firm. And um, I'm going to assume that these ideas are drawn on ID uh, according to a fresh air distribution that gives us a very nice um, uh, constant elasticity um, um, uh, adaptation probability. The probability that an idea is optimally adapted to an industry J is actually going to be a function of kind of market profitability in industry J, right? So remember what I said these BJs and BKs represented, they represented relative industry sizes, right? So this is exactly the idea that if industry K becomes suddenly bigger for the firm, uh, then ideas are going to be reallocated uh, to away from J and towards K, and it's going to be reallocated with a rate of that, with an elasticity according to theta, and so theta is going to parameterize this concept of rivalry. So you can put the two together, and you can generate a very nice closed form expression for the expected sales of the firm in a given industry J. It's going to be a function of the scale effect uh, parameterized by rho and this rivalry effect that's parameterized uh, by theta. And uh, just to kind of um, show you uh, kind of analytic results that we can uh, generate, if you take that um, elasticity uh, within the firm, um, you can look at the elasticity of expected sales in industry J with respect to any shifter uh, demand in industry K. And it's going to depend precisely, as we uh, speculated, on this trade-off between scalability, rho, and rivalry theta. So the more non-rivals, so the lower is theta, the more scalable are resources uh, that are shared, uh, the higher is that transmission elasticity. And this lambda and mu uh, are going to be shares that parameterize the degree of input M overlap that two uh, sectors, J and K, have. Right? So remember, if J and K have no ability to benefit from shared inputs, they use totally different things. I use engineering, we use advertising, then, then, then there's nothing uh, there for me. The cost elasticity is going to be zero. Um, so, so that's really the intuition behind the model. And so let me spend three minutes uh, showing you a little bit uh, what the results are. So these are little graphs that show you that the structural estimation uh, is also able to hit non-targeted moments in the data. Um, and so how do we kind of make sense of the, um, the joint production technology that we've estimated and what does this mean, right? So one nice kind of macro exercise to do is to try and decompose um, aggregate increasing returns to scale in US manufacturing into what's due to these like cross elasticities in the aggregate and what's due to uh, same industry increasing returns to scale. So how important is that scope channel, which is the new thing that I'm adding here. 
So to set it up, I'm going to think of a general equilibrium setting. There's three regions, there's trade, but we're just going to be focusing on US and kind of industry dynamics within the US. We're going to shut down other reasons why industry outcomes might be interdependent, just so we can crystallize our understanding of what's happening in, in uh, due to joint production. But it's, it's, it's very easy to add these other ingredients to the model as well. Uh, we're going to calibrate the one thing I don't estimate is the demand elasticity. We can do a we can you know, run robustness, and I've done that uh, of sigma, you know, other different ways. One nice benchmark is to pick values of uh, the demand elasticities such that at the sectoral level, uh, you're going to match estimates of scale elasticities uh, that exist in the literature. So one recent paper that, that has done this is a paper by Barami, Costino, Donaldson, and Rodriguez Claire. So we're gonna just going to pick sigmas that match that. We can also pick constant sigmas, but the results wouldn't change. Uh, by that much. Uh, and so within this setting, uh, the key equilibrium object that's endogenous uh, for the US is the industry by industry level aggregate price index, right? And that aggregate price index is constituted of prices of every firm, uh, every US producer uh, within that industry J. And this is exactly where if you think there's a demand shock in industry J, that's going to affect firms output in J, it's going to affect their marginal costs uh, in not only J, but also in K. And that might have effects on industry price indices and so measures of competition in K. And that might actually trigger further rounds of changes for firms that are not in J, but are in K. Uh, or, but then the, those, if those firms are jointly producing in other sets of industries, these effects are going to percolate. Right. So in theory, this is a very hard problem uh, to solve, but I show that uh, you can characterize all of these percolation effects uh, through a very simple and intuitive joint production matrix psi, uh, which contains in its off diagonal elements only micro elasticities from the joint production function. So um, what's driving these off diagonal uh, cells to be different from zero in psi? Um, that's going to be only non-zero whenever rho is not equal to theta, whenever there are shared inputs. Um, uh, that are, um, for example, scalable and non-rival within the firm. And that sort of goes back to the intuition I uh, mentioned in the beginning. So in the one minute I have left, um, let me just kind of show you what I'm going to do, right? So in RTRT, the psi matrix completely characterizes the, the elasticity of uh, the vector of uh, producer prices at the industry level uh, with respect to a set of demand shifters. Just for comparison to other models, for example, in a benchmark, constant returns to scale, single industry per model, every element of that psi in my general equilibrium setup would be equal to zero, right? And there are other models that have kind of um, models with own industry increasing returns to scale are gonna have uh, non-zero uh, main diagonal elements, but they're still gonna have zero off diagonal elements. And so the off diagonal elements are gonna be what this model uh, brings to the table. So let's think about how important are those off diagonal elements. We're gonna do this in an open economy setting. In an open economy setting, there's a slight adjustment you have to make to the transmission matrix because there's a bit of a market stealing effect. If US producers get better, they're gonna take market share away from foreign firms and that actually expands their output and then lowers the prices by even more potentially. Right, so this is going to end up being the transmission matrix. We're going to decompose that matrix into um, uh, the own industry cells and the cross industry cells. And that's going to allow us to run that decomposition exercise uh, to think about what uh, percent of the overall increase in returns to scale um, are due to these cross elasticities. And this is the result that this is um, the dark blue bar constitutes the effects that are driven by economies of scope. And um, they constitute about 25% of what we would pick up as aggregate increase in returns to scale. And, and what's cool, I think, to me is you can actually derive these transmission matrices. So here's one, you know, where I've done this at the four digit next level, just because the 200 by 200 one will be too large. But you see something sensible emerging, where, for example, industries like uh, computer electronics, uh, 334, um, are strong transmitters of economies of scope. And industries like chemicals are actually strong beneficiaries of economies of scope. Um, so there's a lot, and, and then there are actually a good amount of industry pairs um, that have diseconomies of scope. Um, because what I haven't mentioned is in the structural estimation, I'm also allowing a residual shared input to so something we don't observe. So as a proxy for everything else that might be going on within the firm. So things like um, uh, span of control issues and so on, and, and financial frictions potentially. Um, so that's this, this that's a, so I'm actually out of time. So I'm just gonna, um, um, I'm just gonna put up this conclusion slide and just say uh, that, you know, there's new theory and evidence on, on a concept I find fascinating, which is joint production. Uh, I find that this is um, really driven by knowledge inputs within the firm and, and that this constitutes in the aggregate a, a new dimension of how industries are interlinked. I'm happy to take questions uh, both now as well as, you know, um, uh, offline. Thanks. I am out of time, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Yes, we, we can open it up to, to questions. No. 
I guess I, I can start as well. So, so the one I guess, tricky thing when you do uh, with with economy of scale is like the right the firm level is a little different than the industry level, and like entry is a, is a kind of one thing that kind of mediates the distinction between those two of them. Um, it, did I get it, I get it right that in your your, your kind of factual uh, you, you you shut down entry? Uh, that's right. So I, I don't have entry of completely new entrepreneurs. Um, right. but what I'm actually going to have is a latent mass of firms that are inactive um, because, because of the stochasticity of uh, knowledge creation, right? There are actually firms that are going to be dormant in every period because these are firms that have not successfully produced any ideas. And, and so when you have shocks in the model, uh, they might actually induce uh, so there's going to be natural entry and exit uh, of firms, but it's not kind of the kind of crude. It's not responding to profit, though. In the, in, in the... Sorry? It, but it's not responding to the profit incentives more. It's, 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 well, well, no, it is. It is, right? So suppose, suppose, so suppose there's like a um, uh, hundred uh, firms that are currently dormant, but you shock Industry K, uh, like Industry K has more foreign demand now. Out of those hundred dormant firms, more likely than not, uh, some of them uh, will now, um, um, uh, you know. So, like, uh, sorry. So, those one hundred firms are going to every period. Maybe ten percent of them will innovate on something, but there's some randomness, right? There's a distribution of industries in which that would be their first industry of entry. But now that distribution is more shifted towards industry K. It's biased towards the industries where demand shocks have occurred, right? Positive. So, so there is that kind of. This is exactly what I meant. There's endogenous entry uh, in the model. Yeah, but I could I could do a I could do a counterfactual. I mean, I could do a model extension as well, where I, um, you know, think that there's a fixed cost, for example, of um, becoming an entrepreneur, and that way, kind of the overall stock of firms, stock of entrepreneurs, um, you know, for sure, there's a profit incentive there, and and maybe one way to answer your question is that, um, uh, you know, uh, firm net profits are. Uh, is a term that I have to carry around in the in the general equilibrium of the model, right? It's not going to be equal to zero. It's not going to be driven down to zero due to free entry. Uh, Pago? Uh, I was curious uh, where you look at the, um, compare the effect within a firm with effects across firms or similar shocks, maybe within a, a proximity area. Whether it's location, whether I guess just to compute, just to, to get a whether how these within firm knowledge uh, uh, sharing compare with maybe knowledge sharing within an industry with within a location or not. Oh, I see. Yeah, so kind of comparing the magnitudes of this within firm mechanism to something like um, knowledge externalities and spillovers exactly. at the vocal level. I guess uh, Israel has a, in the scalable perspective paper some discussion on diffusion, and I'm kind of curious to see whether there is how mm -hmm. this compares and how organizing production within a firm may be a way to internalize some of those diffusion that happen across firms or not. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I don't have the, I don't have the kind of, I don't have this force in the model. Like firms are not thinking about whether they want to acquire uh, competitors in the region, for example. But in the data, um, I imagine there might be some correlation. Exactly, exactly, and that's and that's something I could I could do more. Um, uh, I could do more in in terms of seeing how how strong it is in the U.S. data uh, that I have. Yeah, I haven't I haven't actually. So I've tried to tie my hands and not open up too many dimensions or any more dimensions than I. I mean, have. for this and paper, it's not the, the right you know, thing. So to I haven't do, done anything with respect to geography, but I think geography is 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 absolutely important as well. Yeah. Who is that? Hi, Jan. Very nice paper. Um. So one question I had of something that perhaps you will help me think about. I wasn't sure exactly how kind of what variation was identifying the, the economy of, uh, economies of scope here and what mm -hmm. I, what I had in mind is so for example if you think about the car industry it is known that the car industry has become less vertically integrated over time and then how much of that is being picked up here as you know if you're becoming kind of more specialized in a particular part of the process of say producing a car 
would that mechanically shift your estimate of um, the kind of your your scope as a firm, right? And I wasn't I wasn't entirely sure how this was being identified in the data. And I imagine this is a feature of the data you're looking at for the period that that you are studying. So I was thinking, you know, yeah. how how do these trends in vertical disintegration are yeah. affecting your your measurement here? Yeah, so you have kind of two related questions. So one is about vertical and one is about what variation is identifying economies of scope. So on the vertical side, um, I'm actually stripping away intra-firm shipments um, of goods from one industry to another. And precisely because that's that's something that's happening within the firm for vertical related reasons. And that's not, so, you know, if-, if, if, if What do you mean it's stripping it, away? Effectively, what so is in the data, In the data I have, I can identify what um, portion of uh, shipments are being shipped to um, customers outside of the boundary of the firm and what share is, is shipped within. And so when I, when I look at the left-hand side variable in both the structural estimation and the reduced form, um, I'm looking at just the component that's external sales. So sales to non-affiliated. Um, I understand, but the problem is that if you're becoming, so sometimes you're becoming, if you're becoming less vertically integrated, you might be just deciding to outsource part of the production of this good. And that's going to generate, in, say, across firm transactions that before were done within the firm. It's just that now the firm is more specialized in a particular feature of that process that says producing a car. No, so I guess my response would be that if a firm is goes from vertical special goes from being vertically specialized to you know outsourcing, so throwing out its upstream sector, in my data that wouldn't make a difference at all. If the firm wouldn't have had an up, upstream sector that had external sales in the first place, like suppose their their upstream sector was just satisfying um, internal production for its downstream use, right? This is going to be a single industry firm in my data because I'm focused on external sales. So that's, I, I think I think actually what you mentioned is really important. That's partly why I wanna focus on external sales. Um, I don't know if that helps. And so- um, Yeah, I'm not sure I fully, I fully understand because the supplier is generating external sales to somebody. So, so the now there is a new supplier, the he's gonna shop like, in your data. So maybe this is, maybe let me try and answer the second part of your question. So all the variation I'm using to identify uh, economies of scope and scale are coming from within the firm, right? So it's not about um, what's happening to my suppliers and if, if my downstream sector gets shot, it's what happens to uh, the sales that I make uh, to other uh, parties of a different industry within my firm. Um, so intuitively, uh, and then I guess we're out of time, what's driving economies of scope, uh, what's identify, helping identify economies of scope is cross-industry elasticities. What's helping identify economies of scale is same industry elasticities. So by how much does your output in the same sector respond with respect to a demand shock? Um, and, um, and- Yeah, that, that, thanks, so, thanks for the, uh, sorry to cut this off, but uh, we've got to move on to the next paper. So uh, do you want to uh, unsharing your slides? Um, oh yeah, sorry. Um, our next paper is by, uh, by Daniel Overbeck. Yes, thank you very much. Let me just- Share my screen. So can everyone see it full screen? Okay, yeah, then um yeah, hi and also welcome and thanks a lot for sticking around that long. So first of all, thanks a lot for uh, the organizers to putting our paper here on the program. So it's really an honor to be here and I'm uh, really happy to be talking to you today. And our topic of today is uh, place-based policies and structural change with evidence from India's special economic zones. And this is a joint work with Johannes Gallet from the University of Bochum, Adin Riedel from the University of Münster, and Tobias Seidel from the University of duisburg essen So as a quick motivation, let me tell you that over the last two decades, the number of special economic zones has increased drastically to be more than over 5,000 nowadays across the globe. So this is indeed a very prominent place-based policy with the main goal to stimulate economic activity and generate jobs in targeted regions. So while the majority of these SEZs is actually located in developing and emerging economies, the literature on the effects in such settings is quite scarce. Again, most of the literature is uh, constrained to China. So there still remains an ongoing controversy about place-based policies in low- and middle-income countries. Particular questions remain open as to what are the effects for employment, output, or welfare in the regions, and in which environments do place-based policies and special economic zones work if they work at all. 
So what we do in our paper is we evaluate uh, the case of India, yeah, where we leveraged the so-called Special Economic Zones Act, which was legislated in 2005, and triggered the opening of many Special Economic Zones. And we look at the opening and beginning of operation of over 140 Special Economic Zones in India. And we do so by, first of all, getting hand collect data on the exact location and beginning of operation of these zones, and then match this with geocoded administrative data on employment, population, and the number of firms. Econometrically, we will apply a very simple difference and difference approach to explore the changes in employment or the number of firms within SEZ municipalities and also neighboring municipalities, thereby being able to capture potential spillover and relocation effects. So what we find in our paper is in a nutshell that within SEZ municipalities, non-agricultural employment increases by more than 47 percentage points relative to reference locations, which we choose to be 20 to 25 kilometers away from the zone. Importantly, we also find positive spillovers for regions distance up to 10 kilometers away from the zone. We provide suggestive evidence here that this is generally driven by new activity and that relocation of economic activity is only a little part of the story and actually negligible here. So that this increase in employment and manufacturing and service employment really rises at the expense of agriculture. So within the localities where it increases, this is always paralleled by a decrease in agricultural employment, thereby suggesting a structural change of the local economies. By the virtue of our data, we can um, also show that a significant share of these jobs are created by small and informal firms, again, which has, of course, employment quality and also fiscal um, uh, quality implications here. And we also show that there is a large gender bias in the agriculture in the non-agricultural employment gains, as they're particularly captured by men and women do not seem to benefit at all from the policy. Lastly, we also show that there's little heterogeneity with respect to the type of SEZ, so whether it is a private SEZ or public developed SEZs, and also the industry designation. So, for example, whether it's an IT specialized zone or a manufacturing specialized zone, does not seem material for the overall uh, effects. So, just very briefly on the related literature, first of all, I'm, I'm sure I won't do justice to all the great papers that are out there on place based policies, just to name a few here. So, for advanced economies, we know quite a lot already. So, the just to name a few papers here, so there's a nice overview by Neumark and Kolko, the group Berlin et al. Um, studied the case of, of French, and Bussel uh, et al. and importantly, Kleine Moresi, of course, study famous place with policies in the US, and the Ehrlich and Seidel provides some studies for Germany. So within uh, lower income countries, most of the studies are based in China, and here I want to mention the study by Wang in 2013 and Lu and co-authors co in 2019, who basically both find positive effects on investment employment and wages within SEZ hosting communities, but with limited spatial spillovers to surrounding communities. So also recently I had the pleasure to discuss a great paper on industrial zones in Vietnam by my cake um, and co-authors. In India, Place-based policy schemes other than the SEZs have been studied, for example, by Chori in 2017, and Asha Novozat in 2020, who study uh, the Rural Roads Program, and Blake Steele, uh, who study um, the Land Rezoning Program in Karnataka. However, we think that SEZs are probably the most prominent and most prevalent place-based policy in India, so we um, want to study the effects of SEZs here in our paper. So as a quick background, here's uh, the timeline. Um, from 2000 to 2020, and you see the number of operational SEZs. For operational means that at least one firm already started business within this zone. Okay, so just a heads up: there can be, of course, often SEZs are notified by the government, but um, the date of operations are not clear. So it's not that once they're notified, operation directly starts. But this means really zones in which economic activity is already happening, and you see that while they're virtually zero around the early 2000s. After the SEZ Act in 2005, these numbers increased drastically, and we leveraged the opening of all the zones that were became operational between 2005 and 2013. So now I guess it's time to tell you a little bit more about um, what these special economic zones are. So they are designated areas, so geographically bounded areas, in which the terms for conducting business are facilitated compared to their surrounding administrative region. And now in India in 2005, the SEZ Act provided a uniform legal framework of how these things should be operated and the law stated the main goals, 
to attract foreign and domestic investment, in particular the support or exports of goods and services to promote additional economic activity, employment opportunities, and build and improve infrastructure facilities. Then the incentives that are, which firms are given that are based in the zone are 100% income tax exemption for the first five years, which is reduced to 50% for the following five years, they're also exempted from the minimum alternate tax, which is a sort of top up tax in India if your effective tax rate is too low. I was until 2012 here. And um, they firms enjoy duty free imports uh, on, and domestic procurement of goods and services. And what is the important caveat here is that SEZs are not part of the domestic tariff area. Okay, so basically, if a firm is within the SEZ and wants to sell into the domestic tariff area, then import tariffs apply. Okay, so this also explains why not. Every firm in India simply wants to be in such a zone, but especially exporting zones that want to be located in such a special economic zone. So also there can be heterogeneity, so special economic zones can be specialized in certain industries, such as IT and manufacturing, as I already mentioned, and also on the developer side, they can be developed by private or by public bodies. So the data we use um, in our analysis of, first of all, most importantly, the information on SEZs. So we have from the Ministry of Commerce, we have a list of um, all the SEZs, the location, the industry type of developer and their area. Okay. So what we don't know is the date of exact operation. So as I already hinted that the date when economic activity is really um, starting in the zone. And we web scraped this from newspapers and various online articles and then code data of operation for each of these zones. Once you have this uh, geocoded information on the SCZ, we spatially merged this with municipality shape file from 2001, where we can then identify the hosting municipalities. Now as a disclaimer with municipalities, I always mean towns and villages of India. So we have the shape file for all of these and we can compute then for all of them, the distance to the special economic zone. Okay. To track these municipalities and geographically over time and over different data sets, we make use of the Shrug data set provided by Sam Esha and co authors, which give time constant IDs for these municipalities. So, to the municipalities, we can merge administrative data taken from the economic, cen economic census first, which gives the universe of non agricultural establishments with the locations, so the municipalities, the employees by, by gender, number of firms, and, um, uh, and so on. So, this is really and the universe is important to mention. It's also capturing the informal sector. So each small vendor, all of them are in this census. The, the other administrative data source, the population census, which we again have three waves, which covers in population, agricultural wor workers, infrastructure, literacy rate, number of schools, and all of this again linked to the municipalities. So here's a, a map of India where you see with all the blue polygons, um, the locations of the special economic zones we use in our analysis. So um, as you see, uh, definitely around the industrial hubs such as Delhi and Mumbai, there seem to be a lot, there seems to be some clusters of these zones, but at least in the South, looks like they're also fairly evenly distributed here. So now we'll talk about the sample creation in a few slides and just to make this very clear and be precise about what we're doing and how we identify uh, treated municipalities. I wanna do this in some, with some illustrations here. So first of all, this is, the, the blue polygon here is the central point of the reliance as is at Jamnagar Gujarat, which we'll take as an example. So we have the central point as we know it from the Ministry of Commerce. We can then integrate this into the municipality shape file, which lines out all the municipality borders up to 50 kilometers away from the zone. In the next step, we draw a circle around the central point because it's important to mention that we don't know the exact shape of these zones, but we know the area. Yeah, so what we do is we simply approximate uh, the shape as a circle and draw the circle such that the resulting area matches the area for which we have the information. So then we can classify the municipalities which touch upon the circle. So all borders, so all municipalities with borders now intersect with this um, with the circle. We will treat them as SEZ municipalities. Okay. And for all the other municipalities up to 50 kilometers away, we will classify them into distance bands of five kilometers. Okay. And we would, so we basically have here zero to five, five to 10, and 45 to 50. And we'll do so for all the SEZs you just saw on the India map. And this then creates a final municipality sample. Okay. And this municipality sample can be then merged with the uh, economic and the population census. 
So here's some sample descriptives, what this looks like. So I've already quite a few uh, municipalities here. So this is now information aggregated at the municipality level. So for non-agricultural employment, um, we have over 130,000 uh, observations here. So we can distinguish them by gender. And also we distinguish by firm size. And we do so by the firm size, we define firms with more 10 or more employees as large firms and firms of less than employees as small firms. And this is motivated by the fact that in India, um, firms of less than employees are officially tapped the unorganized informal sector. Okay, and this has implications as uh, small firms of less than employees are uh, not due to pay um, social security taxes. And as we all know, I guess you are much more likely to be informal and uh, evade taxes overall. Um, secondly, we also have agricultural employment taken from the population census. Here we have it again by gender, and importantly, also we can distinguish between main and marginal workers. Where main workers are those that work full time, so more than 183 days per year in agriculture, and also can be cultivators, so people who potentially own their agricultural land. The other ones are marginal workers, so those that work less than 183 days per year, so temporary agricultural workers. We also have information on the, on the firm side, and also on population, literacy, number of schools, paved roads, and electricity access in these municipalities. So what do we do with it? Here's our main estimating equation. And what we have, we have on the, right, the left hand side, the, the log of the dependent variable, which could be example now employment or a number of firms in municipality I in year T, where we're now going to compare the year 2005 and 2013, for which we have the economic census works. Okay. And most importantly here, what we're interested in is a summation term over these beta d coefficients. Yeah? And we can have some here from d equals 0 to 10, and these indicate the, the distance bins, right? from 0 to 5 up to 45 to 50 kilometers away. So beta d's here are coefficients to the interaction terms of this capital D, which is an indicator when it's, where the municipality is in some distance ring to an operational SZ in 2013. And this is interactive with the time dummy for the year 2013, so we're going to have the post treatment um, uh, year. So we, of course, include the post-treatment um, fixed effect here and um, control for municipality fixed effects. So what this then does is that the beta D captures the differences in employment trends in municipalities and distance ring D relative to municipalities in the reference category or category here or omitted category at 20 to 25 kilometers. And now let's take a look at uh, here our headline results. So first of all, if you focus on panel A, we see how uh, these beta Ds Evolved between 2005 and 2013. Okay, and you see that we have a, a strong, uh, a strong and positive effect here at zero kilometers. So this amounts up to 47 percentage points, and also the SEZs that touch upon SEZ. Okay, so SEZ municipalities. So this is strong and significant, and importantly, there are positive effects here up to 10 kilometers away. So even at five kilometers and 10 kilometers, there is a strong positive effect. Importantly, this effect virtually drops to zero here from 15 kilometers onwards. And stays insignificant zero throughout up to 50 kilometers. So this is a strong effect. Of course, now the, the main threat to identification here as well, the parallel trends assumption might not hold, right? So they could have been on different employment uh, paths before, and this is simply what, we, what, we, what we're catching up here uh, in panel A. So to accommodate this, we run a placebo regression where we do the same analysis, but simply compare the involvement between 1998 and 2005. So take these municipalities, but in a period where none of these special economic zones have been established or became operational. And then you really see that here's a completely flat effect. So it doesn't seem that um, there's a significantly different um, developments here across these municipalities, which reassures us that what you're measuring in panel A is really the causal effect of the special economic zones. So now a key question is, where do these jobs come from, given the sludge effect? And importantly, to what extent it's a simple by driven by relocation. Okay, so to what extent local positive effects driven simply by firms or the employment moving um, moving away somewhere else closer to the zone, which would make the, make the net effect of such policies questionable. Right? So we kind of speak to this issue by regressing employment in municipalities distance more than ten kilometers from SEZ, so where we saw this zero effect on employment within ten kilometer radius. Okay, which where we saw this huge positive effect. This will give us some suggested evidence of whether there is relocation going on. And such regression, the neg neg negative coefficients would imply relocation, right? So the positive increase there will decrease employment elsewhere. 
So here are the results. And what you see if you focus on the first row is that um, the employment in the ten kilometer radius does have a, ne a, a negative coefficient here on employment They're out, out more outside. However, those are really uh, small coefficients and insignificant uh, throughout. Okay. One could already say that, well, it doesn't seem that much of an issue, but even if we would take these negative coefficients at fa a face value, despite their insignificance in the back of the envelope calculation, this would amount to only 1% of the estimated effect. So the negligible effect of 1% uh, is due to relocation. Yeah. Yeah. And even one would say, um, well, it could be still from further outside. Um, here's some graphical evidence that, well, if we basically extend our analysis to a two 200 kilometer radius, we also do not really see any significant effects here. So it is not really affected by the zone, even going further, 200 kilometers. So if not relocation, natural follow-up question would be, well, what then, right? And we in this slide, we uh, make the case that a lot of this effect is driven by local structural change of the economies. And in particular, we see that within as you said, municipalities and surrounding municipalities, employment and agriculture, it decreases strongly. Okay, so this is a, a strong effect amounting up to 25 percentage points. And this, I mean, it just falls short of significance where there's a p-value of like 0 0.108. Okay. So it really seems that within these locations, people are moving out of agriculture into this manufacturing and service employment. Okay, so sectoral shifts of the local workers. We can further dissect this into main workers and marginal workers, and we find that for main workers, so those who have potentially higher opportunity costs because they're full time employed or they even own land, right? The effect is not that strong, so much around zero here. However, for marginal workers, there's a strong negative effect, suggesting it's really the temporarily uh, workers that move out of the agri agricultural sector towards manufacturing and services. Um, in panel D here, we take the population as a dependent variable to to look at uh, potential migration, okay? Because there is a strong effect, so migration might be part of the story. And we really see positive effect here on a uh, population within the SEZ and surrounding municipalities. So we really think this is migration because fertility really seems to be kind of unlikely. As a heads up, of course, we also run the regressions uh, controlling for population. So this doesn't explain away the main effect, but it is definitely here part of the story. 10 minutes. Oh, thanks, thanks. Um, so regarding employment heterogeneity, so with the data we have, we can also speak to the, to the quality of the employment and kind of dissect this. And what we do is, as I already ended that, look at employment within large firms and employment within small firms. And really see that well, for large firms, there is a strong effect here and within SEZ municipalities, I'll write drop into zero directly at five kilometers. Okay. So this is very imprecisely estimated simply due to the fact that there are very little large firms in India, as you might, I guess, don't need to tell the, this audience here. So um, this is a large effect here, and we think this is mostly really the, the large exporting firms which are located in the zone. But regarding spillovers, it doesn't seem a uh, lot not, not happening um, for firms, for large firms in the surroundings. For small firms, however, the, the, the picture here very much resembles uh, our headline results. So we see that small firms here significantly benefit from the special economic zone. So seeing that within the municipalities, there's a strong effect and also spillovers up to 10 kilometers away. And importantly here, again, there's a zero effect throughout from 15 kilometers onwards. As I already told you, there is a, there's a gender bias in this effect, as we show here that non-agricultural male employment uh, is really increasing strongly and responding strongly to the policy here close to the zone with significant spillovers, while the female employment here hardly, hardly increases. Okay, and this is actually contrary to many observers' expectations in India who, who suggested that um, special economic zones would uh, source from this unused female labor force, but this is really not what we see happening here in our data. So, as you said, are not kind of some uniform thing, but they can be heterogeneous and uh, importantly in two kind of dimensions. So first of all, the kind of develop, developer yeah, uh, matters or could matter, right? So SEZs can be run privately in India or could, can be run publicly. Okay, so it's just not just a, a government thing, but also private developers can engage in special economic zones. And our que natural question to ask you, which would be interesting in developing, but general economics context, right? Are privately developed and managed as it's more efficient than public ones? Okay. Second question one could ask is, 
if it's a, a special economic zone is specialized in certain industries, the employment effects differ across these industries in terms of their employment generation effect. And here's some, uh, some, some bar charts just to show you that there is indeed some heterogeneity. First of all, the different numbers, but most of them are actually private and also they're much more IT than multi-product zones in India. And also regarding the, the SEZ area, well, not really surprisingly, multi-product SEZs, which we think of as mainly manufacturing SEZs, seem to be much larger than IT zones. Okay, so this already could have an effect in the spatial analysis, right? And um, also regarding the, the locations in which these, these zones are lo located uh, seem to differ. Okay, so, so pre-treatment, we see that IT uh, zones and also private zones seem to be located in much better performing localities than, for example, public and also multi-product ones. This is both in looking at mean employment in these municipalities, but also when looking at the mean nightlight intensity, right, which is often an indicator for economic development. So private, um, a private zone seems to be the one that are uh, more located and more drawn to these better performing areas than private ones, than public ones. So in order to kind of also uh, account for this correlation, we apply cause and exact matching to make public and uh, private zones, for example, comparable. So for example, to control for the fact that IT zones are mostly developed by private buyers. Yeah. And we do so and uh, compare the effects. And we really see here, for example, in panel A, when we compare public versus private SEZs, we see that uh, these effects are strikingly similar across the board. Okay, So we don't really see a lot of a difference here in the effect. So in the SEZ municipalities, they really almost look the same. If anything, one could say that, well, public, especially economic zones, seem to be better at um, producing spillovers to the surrounding regions. Okay. Same holds true when you compare IT and multi-product, uh, special economic zones. So we see that uh, there is a positive effect here, a stronger, they're very similar, right? And also throughout, actually, the, the, there's not much of a difference to be told. I mean, all these case, even if it looks like it, the difference is uh, insignificant. Okay. So lastly, one goal that uh, the SEZ policy here pointed out was clearly to improve infrastructure for the local municipalities. Okay, So we take, take a look at the infrastructure variables because we have it from the population census. And when we look at it, we really see that uh, there isn't, isn't much going on in terms of infrastructure. So first of all, maybe a little bit different, but the literacy sort of educational attainment in terms of literacy here doesn't really seem to be improving okay close to the special economic zone if anything this is negative but it's not really clear what to make out of this at least there's not strong evidence for something happening here yeah? for number of schools there is a slightly positive effect here which we think however is partly mechanical right because if it also we saw this population increase therefore you simply also need kind of more schools there but it doesn't say anything about the quality of these schools or the real infrastructure um, effect. Regarding electricity, kind of surprisingly, and also paved road access, there's not much we see here. So that really seems to be zero effect, at least everything is insignificant. So that is somewhat surprisingly, given that also actually the special economic zones, at least with the large manufacturing zones, need some kind of infrastructure to, uh, to be supplied. Okay. So we have a bunch of other results. Um, and I think I'm doing uh, uh, more than good at times. So um, let's just take one look here uh, in terms of robustness and with nightlight intensity, because that's often used, right? It's also an indicator of economic development here. And we see that uh, for the treatment period, we really see that there is a strong effect here. Well, the huge spillovers up to even 25 kilometers, then this effect kind of flattens out. Also the placebo here is really striking and supporting uh, the analysis to add uh, the, the result that we're measuring a cause and effect of the SEZs here. Okay. So I guess now I'm uh, kind of done. So let me um, let me conclude here. So what we saw, see is that um, special economic zones in India are very prevalent and prominent place-based policy. So they exerted robust and a sizable effect on employment within housing municipalities, importantly exerted positive and significant spillovers up to 10 kilometers away from the zone. We find suggestive evidence that this is generally new activity instead of strong relocation. And we show that the SZ policy contributed to structural change as we saw that this huge local effect in the manufacturing and service employment is paralleled by a decrease in agricultural employment in the local municipalities. 
By the virtue of our data, we can speak to an important uh, part of the economy by showing that a large part of these employment facts is driven by small informal firms, which first of all has uh, employment quality implications, but also fiscal revenue implications. I mean, after all, one should not forget that these special economic zones give huge tax benefits to large firms. So key question is also from a public uh, economics perspective, right? Can these uh, foreign tax revenue be rebated by spillovers to firms that actually pay taxes? And given that much of this is simply captured by small informal firms, this kind of seems unlikely. There's also a social dimension to the SEZ policy, and we show that non-agricultural employment gains here are particularly captured by men. Women do not really seem to benefit. And also, um, there are little effects on local infrastructure, Okay, which somehow both of these effects are somewhat contrary to what observers in India expected of the SEZ policy. We also find that there's little indigeneity with respect to private or public developers, and also the industry designation uh, doesn't seem to be material for the overall effects. So um, now I'm closing with early, but I guess that's rather good than bad. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to any questions or comments, and should you have any. You can open up to questions now. Uh, Sam? Um, yeah, well, thanks. Uh, you saved me on the time thing. I, I went over and uh, you brought us back at two on time. So thanks for that. Uh, super interesting talk. I, I was interested in, um, I guess, two related questions. Uh, well, I guess, um, yeah, so, so first of all, I guess, like, in terms of economic magnitudes, how large are the spillovers that you find relative to the effects within the SECs themselves? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so just to kind of put them in context, um, are these like large economic mm -hmm. spillovers? Mm -hmm. And then I guess, secondly, I, this is something I missed in the beginning of your talk, but did you mention something about how you can't, can you or can you not like identify the exact boundaries of the SECs? Mm -hmm. um, and it just like a question in my mind is, you know, 10 kilometers, is that a large distance? Is that a small distance? Um, and, and, you know, how, how do we kind of put an aggregate number uh, to some of these effects that we're finding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so um, let me get go kind of backwards. So first of all, no, we do not uh, seem uh, we not, do not know the exact boundaries of the special economic zone, and this is something that I mean these things really differ by country. That's why it's also nice to have uh, studies on different countries. So special economic zones in India is really so bounded area, but it's, the, it's not a municipality itself or something. So it's really some 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 bounded things, some bounded area, but we don't know the exact shape. Okay, so we really take the circle. And what you see at also the effect that the zero kilometers really is the effect on the municipality which hosts this SEZ. So it's not necessarily economic activity within the SEZ. Okay. So we cannot really distinguish between well, what what of this what what of this effect is captured within the zone and what is simply captured within the same municipality which hosts this zone. Oh, I see. But then the yeah. spillover effect is mm -hmm. you're outside the municipality. So, so basically, you're, exactly. you're, you're confident that it's a spillover and it's not that you're picking out something that's uh, actually a part of the SEC, right? Exactly. So, oh, so okay. each of yeah, exactly. So each of when I when I go to five kilometers or ten kilometers, that's exactly that that's that's that spillovers. But uh, yeah, so I think they they they're really significant. So. Um, uh, so um, I think we will back up the envelope calculation in the paper, but um, I think also given all these employment effects and given that much of it's driven by small firms, so I think really that, um, I mean, once a large firm settles in the SZ, then like a, like a bunch of suppliers lines up. So I think this is, this is really important. Um, not only the employment within the zone, but also in the outside zone. So that's, a, that's an, uh, definitely an, an important magnitude, but um, probably a good thing to, to kind of put a number on this. Uh, so that's a very good match. Um, not regarding 10 kilometers, I would say it's rather rather a lot. So in, in kind of the, the urban economics literature, people would say that also, for example, relo relocation and spillover effects, I think already uh, five or 10 kilometers would be a large number. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the for the questions and much. Taco? I guess there are two related comments. What, um, oh, to, to the extent that we would like to learn, I mean, this, this is a very cool, uh, uh, interesting result, but to the extent we want to learn about the social returns uh, of, of these economic zones, 
I mean, it's, it's important to understand the, the difference between the, sp the, the spillover effects and the direct effect. The direct effect is, in some sense, it's mechanical, as in I give a subsidy, I would expect a more activity in a location, and maybe in a, in, a, in a new industry that I'm subsidizing. But then the, the difference between the direct and the spillover effects are key to, the, to think about the, the, the social returns. And it, we, nice to to connect them I, I mean i guess one what can think of doing is more structurally but that, that would be you know, a very cool thing to do and related would also be useful to understand uh, if there's any dynamic effects uh say before and after the subsidies are are, are taken away mm -hmm. and they, i guess i will imagine that the persistent effects will be telling me something about uh i guess intrinsic um I guess it depends on the model, but the intrinsic effect that maybe are associated with with the fact that there are some maybe economies of scales that are, are creating in these industries and that kind of lead to some persistent effects on and that it will not be there having we had had these these subsidies beforehand. I don't know whether yeah. you have any, any, any ability to do this. Yeah, the, um, the, the, the problem with this, this thing is one, these things could be done, um, but on a much broader thing. So, for example, I think we could do a thing like nightlights. Uh, this is actually um, like looking at nightlights, there, there we actually have like more, more time periods, right? But uh, so the virtue of our analysis really like going into this employment and and, and firm level uh, so, but data. What so what do you mean? Are these uh, subsidies there for how long? So it's basically uh, a five-year income tax exemption, and then it's reduced to five years. So I, yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. mean, the, the the opposite example would be I, I'm from Argentina. So we have we have this economic one infam infamous economic zone in in Tierra del Fuego, in the low, southest part of Argentina. Okay. Uh -huh. And that's been an economic zone that's been going for over, uh, I think by now maybe four, four decades of subsidies. Okay. Obviously that sounds like a horrible idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. That, but uh, we can have, so what can we learn about the, the timing of these subsidies? That's gonna be cool. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's, that's really, that's really, that's a really good match. Um, Problem is really that we cannot really identify sort of firms that are there, so um, we don't really know. So, but we, if, if you, once it's a subsidy uh, it goes away, that we see these persistent effects and how long exactly do uh, need for for uh, these things to. to exactly, to, but the thing is that even if, if like if like one if like one firm the subsidy ends for the one firm, it could be that at the same time another firm enters and re again receives the subsidy. So the subsidy oh, kind of so depends you, on. Oh, so subsidy forever. To the new firms now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think the new firms get they get new subsidies once you enter. Yeah. yeah. I think um, part of the challenge with these SEZs is, is thinking about them in um, GE, which is are the local gains you're seeing are they actually gains or are they just losses from other people that aren't in the SEZs? That's one, and I guess the revenue side too would be interesting to. It could be an argument that says, yeah, we give the tax breaks in the SEZ, but we make more revenue by these external overflows of, you know, these other firms that spring up around it, the support services, et cetera. Exactly. So so this would be, uh, so it was something I, I hinted at, right? So that's why we kind of distinguish in these, uh, by these small informal firms, because you would say, well, these, far, these firms are very unlikely to contribute significantly to, to revenue. So yeah. um, so from a fiscal perspective, uh, that's kind of the motivation when looking at these, these small firms, because they're exempt from many and also like very likely to not contribute to other um, uh, revenue. But yeah, that's definitely a, a very important point. And I also see your, your comments here. So uh, thanks a lot in the, in the chat. Yeah. You know, one of the big things with the SECs in India that distinguish them in some ways is that a lot of the, a lot of the dispute and the purpose of them is for land. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, large chunks of land are difficult to find, and there's holdup problems, uh, and so this is trying to get around those. So, but anyway, the land rights stuff is a big issue with yeah. the politics there. 
Yeah, sure, sure. I guess also when we, we talk to people, I mean, most of the people are concerned with actually um, uh, with, with this land that it's simply about land speculation. But at least in our data, we see there's some real uh, activity going on and happening triggered by this. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot uh, for all these uh, these questions. Okay. Well. Uh... Thanks everyone um, for, uh, for for a great day, especially to our, our six presenters, uh, the six fantastic papers uh, made, made for a great co conference. Um, so thanks again, and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Before people sign off, let's uh, thank uh, uh, Paco and Ezra yes. for putting together a fantastic program. Yeah, and, thanks And uh, Ed from CEPR uh, for staying late and helping with this um, in terms of delivering it. Uh, so let's unmute, unmute and applaud. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Take care. Thank you. Nice. Thanks. Thank you.